Fumeric Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to AmericHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The discount code is table talk. Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything that you need and nothing that you don't. In other words, no sugar, no artificial coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, and no BS. With the Element, I love the watermelon. The watermelon tastes freaking awesome. I drank one pack every day, no matter what. People that train out here, it's sitting out here for them all the time. The boxes don't last very long. Right now, Element is offering Table Talk listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packages free with any Element order. Get yours at drinkelement.com backslash table talk. The deal is only available through the link in the description. The other thing is if you don't like it, you can just give it away to a salty friend and Element will give you a 100% refund. No risk, money back guarantee. Head over to drinkelement.com backslash table talk. All right, guys, we've got a new limited edition drop, the original Mountain Dog Tea that John Meadows had us design from the very beginning. So it's the first tea that he had made. Once again, this is a limited edition item. So when they're gone, they're gone. While I have your attention, you've seen me wear this one in a few podcasts to date. We've been holding back on it. This here, the four star tea, I think that's what we call it. It's on the website, new items, also under limited edition. Check out our shoulder saver pads. It's an easy way to do limited restricted range of motion. Exercises like board press that basically you just pop the pad on the bar reduces the range of motion, pop it back off when you're done. Thank you guys for the support. Head over to EliteFTS.com. Time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. All right, what's up, guys? We're back with another episode of Table Talk. Today, my guest is Johnny Shreve, IFBB Pro. Last year, he placed fifth in the Masters Olympia 212. Uh, personal trainer, online coach, content creator, author, and mental health advocate. Did I forget anything? I was good enough, man. You're good. Okay. Yeah. So All right. Dad, so, dad, I'm a dad too. A dad, a father. Yeah, yes, it. I have that in you there. That? We're good. Um, yeah. I even know your child's name, but I'm not going to say it on the air. I think everyone knows mm. it by now. So. <laughs> so that is, oh man, I didn't write it very well. St- uh, Selena. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Selena. Yeah, yeah. And you have a brother that's a battle rapper. Yes. Is he still rapping? He, um, he still, he does. He, he, he ghost writes too. Um, and actually, recently now, he's a uh, producer and DJ, and he um, works with uh, EDM.com. So, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So he's bounced around from, you know, festival to festival, doing media, uh, mainly like the techno part of um, EDM. But yeah. How many years are between you guys? Uh, 21 months. Okay. So when, when you started training, like in the sixth grade, yeah. was he training too? No. Not at all. So he just went he's, all music. He's he, no, well, yeah. So he was he was very much. We both started music when we were young. Um, we both started. I played. He started playing violin when he was three. I started playing piano when I was three. 
and we've kept on going. He mainly focused on instruments, and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, bass, piano, guitar, violin, producing, whatnot. And then I was all sports. Okay. But I still played piano and violin and, and I got into other instruments. I play seven instruments. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but uh, he was the annoying one that was like, you know, we share genetics, so he didn't have to work as hard. Mm -hmm. And he just, you know. So he would just train for a little bit and be right where yeah. you are. Yeah. Yeah. It's annoying. <laughs> super annoying and then and they, you know and have that little bit little little brother syndrome where it's like mm -hmm. you're always competing with him and so he wouldn't work as hard and he would just get his good results did it make you think that you didn't have to work as hard maybe work harder maybe you work harder yeah okay because i just had to be i had to be like better mm -hmm. like had to so when this training started right it was because you wanted to you're like sixth grade yeah right so this hockey player yeah, yeah. was more for sixth grade was more jacked than what yeah. you were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so at what point did the training back then start to steer towards football? It was, it was right when I, like, it was after a year of training and then I got into my, my second year um, of football. And the year, the difference between the first year playing and the second year was like night and day. So like, I, I, I remember feeling the results of having strong legs and running through somebody. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is amazing. Cause I was, and I was like this obsessed with it. I had, I had a coach and I was younger too. So I had good training. So it was almost like the second season I played, it was like automatic. Like this is like screw girls. Like, yeah. So the, the, the first year where you just getting waxed left and right. Yeah. Okay. I was like, so I was like, I remember I finally started, I was a, I was a defensive end. Yeah, like you know, you know, well, Pee Wee, Pee -wee, Pee -wee football, right? Yeah, and I was yeah. playing defensive end, and it was the first time getting hit within the helmet, and you know, kind of getting like a used to the sport. And then from like sixth grade, you know, uh, sixth into seventh grade, it was like maybe I hit a, a, a growth spurt or something at that time. Mm -hmm. But it was I remember having abs, in, you know, yeah. in elementary school, and that would might be my thing, like punch me in the stomach. And did the training through that time because you played all through high school, and then in college as well, yeah. and did it become sport conditioning training oh, everything up until up until i started bodybuilding everything has been sports it, all strength power speed the only uh, the only aesthetic part of training would be like you know doing bicep curls to have nice arms on your jersey mm -hmm. that's it when what during that time period what did you figure out worked and didn't work for you for so for me when it like i was a i remember frankly that like very very like clear i was my uncle got me doing like higher reps from the start it was weird what's that mean he was just he was just like he would tell me to count every other every other rep every other rep every other rep i would count so i would have like i was like seventh grade there'd be a plate on so yeah be 135 and i would do 10 reps but i do 10 reps counting every other one so i'd be doing like 20 reps so mm -hmm. like i would always be doing like a higher volume of reps so i i got really acclimated to, to like having a really good muscle endurance and that helped, I knew that always helped me like grow. I knew that from the beginning. And then when it came to like, um, all my like power stuff, like strength, um, deadlifts, cleans, those are the things that I knew would translate a lot to football. And it was, and I was at like, I was at a young age, I think a grade eight when I was training for, you know, um, your 40, your shuttle, your bench, your squat, dead, your clean. We had to do all these, you know, different things in, in, in elementary school and high school. Mm -hmm. So that's, that I really, the high rep stuff when it came like back and bench stuff was really good. So it translated a lot when I did the combine is I was really good at always repping higher weight. And then when it came to like legs and stuff, it was always something that was lower rep. Yeah. Yeah. So through high school then, <clears throat> your skill got better and your play got better. So during that time period, when when I was playing, if you were a good player, you really didn't have to worry about class. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they just kind of like push you through because yeah. was that the same situation? No. Um, it was a quite so it was quite the opposite, but it was like I was lucky. My um my coaches were like my head our head coach, Coach Lapine, was my math teacher and and our choir teacher. And he was awesome, right? Um my other coach, Coach Mac, he was my religion teacher and sociology teacher. Um, my coach rock, he was another guy like, and they're all like, they're all great football players themselves when they are younger and they're all teachers. So, and I was in all their classes. Mm -hmm. So I, so like, yeah, I did, I did goof around. And I probably got a little, you know, some things kind of like, you know, 
pushed aside, but I was, I was held accountable a lot. They kept me in school. If, I, if they weren't there, I would not be in school. I would have failed out miserably. What led to the, the junior college then? So that was, so they, as much as they helped me in high school, I didn't, I didn't, I never applied myself as much mm-hmm. as I could have. So I had big, I had scholarship offers, letters, and I couldn't, I didn't plastic clearinghouse twice. So I don't know if you know the clearinghouse, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. I, I couldn't, I couldn't get in like two times. I did my, my SAT score wasn't high. It wasn't high enough to offset my core grades mm-hmm. twice. And that was it. So it was like, that's it for you. And then it was basically like, go to like, not, it's not, a, not a junior college, but we have junior football, mm-hmm. which is kind of like junior college. Right? Yeah. So I did that. And then while I was playing junior college, junior ball, that was using that time to upgrade so I can get into school. So that's where the junior college or the junior football upgrade came. as in how get yeah. like, I, like you, you can do your classes. Like there's when I played back when I, um, in my day, I was old saying that we had grade 13 and our grade 13 was like, there were basically almost like first year university courses. Mm-hmm. And you had to have like six of them. And six, if you want to go to university, you have to do OIC. If you wanted to go, just go to college, you just do your regular, um, your core classes and whatnot. Yeah. So if you want to go to like, you know, university or any university that, and in, and is in Canada, only universities have football. So colleges don't have okay. football. They, some colleges might offer a junior football team, but you don't necessarily have to go to the school to play. So I had to upgrade my core classes, my OECs, to get into either Canadian school or to hopefully do um, offset my SAT to get in. How long did that take? I got into school. Let's put it this way. I got into St. Mary's when I was 24. So what is that? Three? So I graduated at 18. Spent, I, did, I played my four years of junior. Mm-hmm. And then my last year I left and I was like, it, the dream was like done. At that mm-hmm. point, I'm like, you, you blew it. And I moved out to Whistler. Um, did what every kid does in Whistler, party and everything yeah. else. And then there is a, 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 a camp that I remember that was in that area. And I was still in contact with a lot of coaches. There's Western Washington, um, UBC. Um, and there's a couple of the schools that I mentioned that I, I contact, like, Hey, I'm going to be at this camp, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I showed up there and, uh, the coaches that did contact me, didn't show up. One guy didn't remember who I was when he was there. And then the only coach I was there that knew me recruited me when I, when I graduated high school, but didn't get in. Mm. So that's how I, I got in basically six years after. What reignited you to do that? Cause if you're partying all the time. Did you just like wake up and hung over and say, this sucks? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was like, yeah, it was, I had this girlfriend um, that was, she challenged me a lot. She was a university kid. She went to Western. She was smart. And, and I was riding this football dream. Like it was my, like, it was my, you know, my bait to her i'm gonna play i'm gonna get to university and play and then i'm that good because i'm gonna go pro right and yeah. i was and i was like and like everyone says they're good i was that good i was good enough mm-hmm. i just didn't have the mental capacity to put in the right direction so um she we moved out to whistler together so when i finished playing football and i was like i finished playing ball like my junior football and i was like there's nothing else to do and she's was she was gonna move out to whistler and i'm like my girlfriend and football is done. So I, yeah. I was like, I'm going to go too. So I follow her out there and she was kind of just there uh, kind of like, where's this football thing at type thing. And I was like, just wasting time. Like I was, it was one of, it was a very reckless time in my life. Um, very fun time, but like uh, equally reckless and equally like just draining. And I knew that I, I just like football was my thing from like a competitive, being competitive, football was like my passion and i was like i gotta take one more swing at this thing and i just remember seeing that i was like i was literally partying it was, it was probably like i don't know probably like six in the morning i yeah. was still awake you know I was, I was like where's this camp at and it was the uh, ron dias football camp and um and i looked at him like let's just do it and a buddy of mine was a uh, before i even started bodybuilding he was the, fir- he was the first person to show me buddy owen he's the first person to show me um pumping iron and as soon as i watched pumping iron i'm like holy shit this is this is fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. So I was, I trained, you know, the way I remember how to train and when it came to like training for your, your 40 and your shuttle and your vert. And then just to look 
bigger size wise, I would train, you know, more like, you know, aesthetic or hypertrophy yeah. or not. And, uh, I got ready for it and I, I, my numbers were still really good. I ran a, uh, four, I ran a four, four, five. Um, I did a four, two shuttle and a seven, three, seven L. And, uh, after my shuttle, he's like, he's like, Shreve, like, yeah, he's like, Hey, he's like, we, we recruited you. I'm like, yeah, I know. I, I didn't get in. He's like, you want to go for dinner? I'm like, sure. And then we went to dinner the next day. And before he could say anything, I was like, look, if you give me your school, I'll play your school. I was like, I need to do, I need to go yeah, somewhere. Yeah. And, and at the time it was good too, because it was lucky because that St. Mary's was like one of the best schools in Canada, um, for football. Uh, it was like, there was, you know, we'd have ex NFL guys who may didn't make, you know, the Packers camp, whatnot, or something like that. We'd have guys from like, we would recruit, we had a great system. We had recruiting guys from Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, New York. So we had a dominant team. And I got to, you know, my second chance was going to St. Mary's and, and hopefully reliving that again. Where do you think you'd be if you didn't have that conversation with that guy? I've thought about that before. And cause I remember I, I, cause I had this, I had, I always do these gut checks to myself. And I remember being like, what was your plan? Like, what was your, like, what was your actual plan? Like, I remember like, I remember at that time, like there was, I had, a, I had a lean on my SIN number, which means like, you can't like, it'll be like having a, your social security number having a lien on it. So you can't get anything government. You can't get your tax and nothing. I owed money to a first student loan that I, I completely like walked out on. And I, I didn't have a plan. Like at the, I, I, knowing that, like in hindsight, I would have, I don't know. Like I would have just, I, I, I didn't have any money when I was there. So I was, when I was in Whistler, it was, you know, I was, I was selling drugs. I was partying. You know, I was, I was living, they call me the couch surfer. They would maybe make jokes be like, yo, CFL, like coach surfer for life, whatever. And I see myself, whatever. And I think the last like few months I was living in a buddy's like, uh, what do you call it? A Winnebago trailers yeah. that didn't have electricity. And I had to run like a little heater on a, on a extension cord all the way from his house. And I live, I lived in that thing for about like four months until I moved back home to a buddy's place and then went to St. Mary's with like 500 bucks in my pocket. Well, I'm assuming during that party time, you weren't training at all. I was. You were? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to be yeah. jacked or? It's, yeah. I was, <laughs> we'd make yeah. jokes. It was like, because there was, a, there was like literally 11 of us, 11 black guys in Whistler. And I was the only one who came from where I came from. Right. So I've, I've never, that's the one thing in my life that's been consistent. Even with my, even with talking to my therapist, I had an outlet that I really didn't know I had, or I was conscious of at the time. Training has never been, has, I've never taken a year off of training. I've always trained. So like, even when I was partying, I was training. I go to the gym without any sleep. That would be like my way. Mm -hmm. And at a time I'd be like, yeah, I gotta, I have to train, no days off, but not realizing that that was just my way of having an outlet. Yeah. So the, the football thing during that time, it, it seems to me like a big a part of that was just like talking shit because you weren't doing anything for it. Yeah. Then the other part was, it was something in your gut. Yeah. You know, that you couldn't live without trying to do. And yeah. it took your girlfriend and this coach. Yeah. Those conversations to be able to light that fire. Yeah. <clears throat> when after that was lit, how much time did you spend prepping for that test or that oh. combine or whatever? Oh, it was, it was October. It was actually remember it was October. Um, when I remember that, uh, it was end of October, it was right at the beginning of the next, of my last season in Whistler. The season starts like end of, use it if it's a really good year, it was, the season will start probably November. Um, it was end of October and the combine was in December. It was like the first week of December. And I trained for, I would say an end of, from the end of October to December. And I remember I was at a party after this whole thing was done. I was at a party the week after and, um, it was four in the morning and I got an email on someone else's computer because I don't have a computer. Like it was, you know, just living yeah. that life. Right. And I looked on it and I opened the first email and the first email was from Western Washington. It was like, regret, I'm sorry to regret that we can't get you in, blah, 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 blah. UBC, same thing. And then the last one was St. Mary's. Congratulations. You've been accepted into the arts program. I was like, I was sitting there, like just started bawling, just started crying and just went out and told my friends and like, and it was really cool because we had a big, you know, going away party and stuff. And I was, I was getting my chance because everyone knew what I was coming from, mm -hmm. you know, when I got there. Like, I was just, who's this jacked dude that's here snowboarding? So then when you got there, what changed? 
St. Mary's? Yeah. Man, it's funny. Um, <laughs> it's some things changed and some things didn't change. Right. So like it's uh I probably I probably hit rock bottom more times than I needed to, but bad things happen for a good reason. Mm -hmm. Right. So when I got there, I got there with 500 bucks in my pocket. Um, literally that was all I had. My, my parents and we had, you know, family members put some money together, whatever I got there. And I, I, I still had to lean on my account. So I couldn't, I couldn't get any money anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I had enough money for rent and a little amount, like for when you go to school in, this, in Canada, you get a scholarship, they will pay for, they'll give you enough money for, they don't give you, don't fully pay for your, um, your housing. They do everything else. Mm -hmm. And you have bursaries and stuff you can get too. So, you know, we have like, you know, um, we have like uh, alumni that can help out different than, than the States. If they did like our alumni in Canada, if we, you guys did it, you get in trouble. It'd be like, you get a booster type thing. Yeah. So we had people like that that would help out, but I blew it. Like my first year, I, um, um, my, I would have graduated with honors if I wasn't for two classes. In my first year, I failed dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs in their world. It was, it was, mm -hmm. I didn't go to class and it was like, you know, if you don't know, if you don't go to class with dinosaurs, mm -hmm. we're not laying about like, you know, trinosaurus sucks. Like what's the hip bone? You know, I can yeah. tell the hip bone from the jaw bone and mesozoic errors and whatnot. So I was the first semester you're on, you're on point, you're training, you know, you're playing it's football, school, football, school, football, school. You can only go after, yeah. after games off season, all hell's great. All hell's okay. great. So I was like kind of on par, like football was like my everything in training. I was a, um, that was like this, I was, I was a leader, captain, training, all that stuff. When it came to off season, it was like time to let loose a little bit. And then, you know, things piled up and then I failed that one class, lost my scholarship for the rest of the semester. Um, I had to borrow money from my mom to help pay for the rest of that semester. Uh, it was, that was pretty, it was embarrassing. Uh, that, and that was the last time I'm like, no more of this. The other class I screwed up on was a religion class. My mom's a reverend. So I was like, I was like, religion, this is going to be easy. Like, mm -hmm. I know all about religion. And uh, it was the history of the Bible. So it was not just, it was, it was an unbelievable class. But I, I, I failed the first semester and got my grades up enough to get a 56. So for those, those two classes, I would have graduated with a 3.0 GPA. So they brought my class down to like a 2.5, 2.6. So for those two classes. So anyway. Um, so after failing those two classes and then losing the scholarship, mentally, what changed when you came back? To be quite honest, I, I, I didn't come back properly at all until my last season of football. Because right after that, my draft year because you can draft there's two day ways you can draft i think it's i forget how many years after you graduate but i think it's like five years after you graduate you can eligible for the draft or you know you're 19 whatever and my draft year was when i was 25 um i was one of the better special teams players in the country um and that's all you do as a Canadian running back if you get anywhere you're going to be chasing down punts mm -hmm. and kicks um i had a good agent like everybody else uh and I got a call from him like the fifth, fourth, fifth round is, it was like Winnipeg or Calgary. He was like, he told me, I'm like, cool. You know, I get on a team or something. Didn't happen. Didn't get it all. Like I had uh, you know, in hindsight, you know, I just was thinking that I would get on, like I was 25. Like, mm -hmm. They're going to take a 19 year old. That's, you know, if they can get big between a fresh 19 year old or a 25 year old. Yeah. You take a 19 year old. So that was, that, that was the day things just spiraled like spiraled down. It was the most heartbreaking time in my life at that point. And I hit, I hit rock bottom, um, I party my face off until I couldn't party anymore. Um, it was in football kept me kind of there. And then that one day I just, I remember, I don't know how, how, you know, graphic I can get, but I remember I was up at, I was up for three days and I was joking around, but I was hitting the back of my head and substances were coming out of my nose. And I remember it, I, I literally remember it coming out in like slow motion and, and people laughing, you know, me laughing, but then like having outer body being like, what are you doing? Like, what the app? And I remember that day, like after everything was said and done, there's, it was literally church. It was six in the morning. There was a church service that was going on at 10 o'clock. I got on a bus. I had a, I had a, um, a 26 or 
of vodka sitting in my in my uh, jacket. It cracked open, fell on me. I was like, F. And I still went to this church. I went to this church and then it's like, I just bawled for like hours. And then I, I checked myself into uh, therapy at school. Mm -hmm. And then I spent my last year um, of school and football getting myself figured out. And then that's when bodybuilding came in. So during that last year, when you say getting yourself figured out, how? I, so I was in therapy, um, like uh, addictions and uh, like we're going down every rabbit hole and like every rabbit hole there was to just like get to my place, get to a place where of like of consciousness. And um, I, it was hard because like I was the guy that you'd call like every night, six o'clock, five o'clock. I knew where the party was. I knew where the stuff was. And I, and I knew that I had to distance myself from all of it. So when I did, like I did, like I, I didn't party anymore. Like I didn't, like I, I walked away from a lot of things and those calls didn't come anymore. You know, people weren't like asking, you know, where's Johnny? It was a very like quiet thing. I listened to house music for like a good, like a year. I was, I was limiting everything that would, that would trigger me to want to go back into doing, being destructive. And what really helped me was that's when I started football, like right after, like at the end of my therapy, at the end of like, at the, at the, I would say halfway through, I started um, uh, bodybuilding and that gave, it was another addiction, yeah. but a good addiction. With the football, was there an identity crisis because you were, after 18 years, you're no longer playing? It was, so there was. And I think that was, like, I was talking to a friend of mine, she's doing a program for the NFL and the NBA, and it's this transition program. Because not a lot of uh, athletes that have a, tr a transition program for them. So like you go, you know, you play football, hockey, baseball your entire life, you go to college, and then all of a sudden you don't make it to the league. It's over. What do you do? What do you do mm -hmm. now? Go work behind a desk. So I didn't like, I remember like, I didn't, I'd, I asked my brother, I had this conversation of the day at the end of the, my last game, I broke my finger at warmups. Um, it was the first time our team ever lost in the championship. So it was like a very, like, it wasn't like the send off that you want. Yeah, yeah. And I remember being like, what am I going to do next? Like, I'm not like, I, I was crying because I was like, um, this is over for me. Like football's done. This dream is done. And I'm like, but I have to do something. So my brother was like, um. At one point, he was like, he was uh, na na known for like being the MMA analyst. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, I think I'm going to fight because I was doing some, you know, uh, no gi jiu-jitsu before, kickboxing, whatever. And he's like, no. He's like, you're number one, they don't make any money too. You're going to have to like cut all the way down to like 150 something. Or if you even stay even at 180, you're going to be fighting something that's like six foot. And I'm like, well, what the, f you know? And then I was like, what next? And then there's always guys, you know, remember Santana Anderson? Yeah. So Santana is, is from, uh, from where I'm at. Fisherman, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So he was one of the guys I met because I used to work downtown at the bars mm -hmm. a lot. And he was a bodybuilder, right? And he, we worked out a couple of times before. So he was, a, he, was a, he was a buddy. And he'd always, you know, like, hey, he's, why don't you bodybuild? And this is when I was playing football. I'm like, I'm oh, bodybuilding. That stuff's stupid. Like, yeah. I'm not doing that. So he was the first guy I called. Him and another couple of other buddies that I knew bodybuild. I was like, when's this, when's this next show that's coming up? He was like, oh, it's springtime. I'm like, I'm doing it. And I was. So how, how did that tra transition work when you're still partying and all the other it, stuff? It was, so it was, it was a perfect time because it was, it was at the end. So my, so my last year was 2010. I graduated 2011. So 2010 was like the most destructive year of my life. It was a just spiral. I remember it was like the weather for some reason, it was like global warming. It was great from December, all the, from like January, all the way until like, you know, October. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was just, and then, and it rolled into football season. We got new jerseys. It was just like, you know, um, at that 2010, that, that end of that party phase was when things started. Like I hit rock bottom beginning of 2011. I was checked in end of 2010, uh, beginning of 2011, I was checked into therapy and I played my last season, not partying. Okay. Right. And then I got into bodybuilding. Cause I can guarantee you, like if bodybuilding wasn't there, Cause that's like, I was like, what's next? And at the time too, like I was doing whatever I could to, to, uh, to survive, like make money or yeah, I was terrible with money. Um, terrible with, you know, keeping a job. I've walked out of like, you know, bouncing jobs and, you know, I'll get another one down the street, whatever type thing. So it was, uh, I would have probably just sold drugs, steroids or something. And then, yeah. 
So what did the prep look like for your first bodybuilding show? Oh, or not two questions with that. What the prep look like? And then your training has to change from yeah. what you were doing before. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's two things kind of going on. Yeah. There. So so the funny thing is is um, my second year playing at St. Mary's, we had a new um, athletic director, and he was good friends and worked with Charles Poliquin. So he brought his uh, methodologies to football, which makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it, in hindsight, was very like bodybuilding. Like, and a lot of his nutrition was very, you know, we got slower when he got in. It was pretty funny, but like, you know, we, we there was the first time we we knew about like dieting, you know, every, every um, position had to be a certain, you know, body fat percentage. So like okay. receivers, like your, spe your specialty or your, um, your skill positions couldn't be more than like 12% body fat. Like if you're a receiver, if you're like, okay. if you're like, you know, you, I think it was like 12 to 15% body fat. If you're a lineman, you can be more than 25% body fat. If you're a linebacker between 15, 20, whatever. So it, it forces a lot of us to like start dieting and whatnot. And it made a lot of us get slower too. Well, you, you, is it because you're in a deficit? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah. Like it wasn't the, it just in hindsight, it wasn't the, you can't, you can't eat that way yeah. and play football. Like just get calories in you and make sure you're fueled and, and whatnot. So I had an idea. It was like we, we went for their periodization, and whatnot. We had our build phase, our, you know, our hypertrophy phase. So we, we already had that. I already had that part in me. And then having that little bit of me always when I was younger, you know, doing higher reps and whatnot, upper body wise. So when I got into bodybuilding, it was like YouTube. It was YouTube galore looking at, you know, how to train. And me as a, as a coach as well, too, I was coaching then. I was always like researching like, okay, how do I do this sport? Like, how do I do this sport? How do I do this sport? And it was bodybuilding. I'm like, okay, how do you do this thing? So I like, I researched it. Um, I got a, um, I got a book on, on, uh, anabolics. It was anabolic, um, I forget what uh, manual it was. But it was that, there was another one. I forget who the author was, but it was a, a buddy of mine who was our, our, um, kicker had this book on hypertrophy and he's like, check this book out. And I took this book at the beginning of my prep and, um, I read that book. Now I haven't said this before. Cause I not really mention his name, but sorry, Santana, I gotta say it to you. Santana was my first coach mm -hmm. and he was prepping for, in hindsight, now I'm like, I'm looking, I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. But he was coaching, he coached me and he was getting ready for, I think, Prague. And at six weeks out, he just was, he was just no show. He was, no, he was MIA, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so at six weeks out for me, I had no clue. Like I had, I had no clue what I was doing. I was, for the entire prep, I was wearing, you know, uh, garbage bags under my you know under my sweats on the stepper you know like thinking that that was gonna like you know do whatever yeah i i remember uh, being like you know hypoglycemic a bunch of times and not really knowing then just being like you know at that point in that you know in in time like oh man i feel really weird like oh i must have worked really hard you know yeah so like i did all i did every every mistake that you can think of as a as a you know rookie first year competitor i did every mistake possible to make on how did the show go um i came third i came third i i came third greg Doucette came first um and then i did uh my first nationals that year i came eighth and everyone above me is are, are all pros now so anton Vall won his mm -hmm. first, won the pro card that year chris wong um oh my god uh paulo amedla was there he plays ninth actually um who else is in that there's a ton of guys that they're all pros now um uh ron partlow so there was like i i did well like my yeah. i did i did fairly well the biggest thing for me was um the posing part of it so i i i did i took dance i you know break and jazz and when i got into bodybuilding there's i didn't know there was this posing aspect of it so the first thing i did was there's this guy that in our locally he had this like he had this uh you know the, the dumbbell chain yeah and he was a head bouncer and he always seen me at the bar and he's like hey shreve and whatever and then i his name is um carl norton and uh he was known as like a good poser so i hired him as a po as my posing coach so easy he was a consistent coach i had for my first prep so i kind of had a good i had a good coaching like from the start knowing how to pose and then the posing part was like the thing that really like drew me to bodybuilding so I could present myself fairly well. And I like being on stage. Yeah. So that was like, so when I got on, like, man, my, uh, 
I use like, like, I forget what it wasn't. It was like a dream tan. Um, I didn't like, I was, I was whiter than people on stage. Like I'm like, it's like, when you look at these pics of me, like you look like, <laughs> like Greg and the other guy were, were, were way darker than I was. I did, you know, I, me and my friend who were prepping together went to a bulk barn and grab like, you know, we packed away junk. Like we went there one day with just like drooling, like, yeah, I can't wait to eat this and yeah. this and this. And I ate the bare bones, nothing. I couldn't afford anything to be in with anyway. So I did the chicken, broccoli and rice, um, type meal. Uh, and then when the show was done, I didn't drink any water. This is the one of the worst things I actually did. And this is actually scary. Um, I didn't know how to do, how to dry out. No clue what the process was. And people were like, you got to get this thing. I don't know if I just did it or not, but um, it was like a Lasix or whatever. Yeah. And they're like, you got to get aldactone. I'm like, what's that? So I'm like, ask people, hey, do you know what aldactone is? And I had friends who were doctors. I'm like, hey, do you know what this is? Like, well, I was like, yeah, but I, I can't tell you how to do Like, John, I can't tell you to do that. And I'm like, well, I don't know what the hell. So a buddy of mine, his girlfriend worked at the hospital, finds Lasix and an injectable. And um, he's like, yeah, I got some. I'm like, oh, sweet, perfect. So I took Lasix on the Friday in the afternoon and then drink water from Thursday until Saturday. Mm -hmm. So this like thing just made me pee everywhere. You know, I just, it dried me out. I didn't drink any water for like three days. Like it was absolutely stupid. And then my first sponsor was there and a member like, oh, I had a, like I was a, I was a water bowl this big at the end of the show. They had this, you know, a water jug full of their BCAs. I was sipping it during the day. It was delicious. And I went over there and just filled this entire thing up show was done slammed this thing back ate all of my you know all my junk had pizza we're gonna go out and have fun after you know didn't make it out i could hardly breathe I was sitting on the bed just kind of like just like and passed out mm -hmm. and then three days later i'm walking to my clients and my client is like about like a 15 minute walk down and i'd have to take two like, breaks every two minutes i'm like what the heck my back is killing me I'm like, my, my legs, like, what the heck? And then I'm like, I, I get, you know, I finally make it there and I get back, same thing. And I'm like, what the heck? And then I remember uh, Santana finally got back to me and I'm like, yo, man, like, what's going on? And he's like, I'm like, my back's kill me, like, my legs and my, my feet are huge. He's like, oh, you got the carb pumps. I'm like, oh, that's what it is. All right, cool. And then just kind of let it go. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, it's like, I got crazy, massive like, like edema yeah. and not really knowing. And my foot was, was massive. Like I was, and I was coaching, I was, I was coaching, um, uh, receivers and, um, such teams. So I'm on the field with my shorts on and these Adidas, Adi zero, you know, football shoes, my ankles, like on the, on yeah. the outside of it. And, you know, like, you know, I'm surprised you got your foot in the shoe. My teams, you know, yeah. the kids was not even like, they're just laughing at me the entire time. Like, oh, your freaking ankle stream. Like, but yeah, that was, when did you decide that you wanted to go pro? Um, after nationals, it was, uh, cause my, my thing was, it wasn't the, I didn't get into this. I, I got into it. I get into things and I want to know how to do it. And what's the, you know, what is the, um, the highest level you can get to, right? Like that, like bodybuilding was my void filler. Mm -hmm. It was like, I didn't, like my transition, I was not ready for, I was not ready to be behind a desk of any sort at all. I wanted to do whatever competing, you know, whatever it was and the prep when everything it was just like, it was all me. I loved it. Like as, as much as I didn't know it to be for my first prep, my second prep, but Mike Johnson coached me and uh, he was coaching, he was helping um, Antoine at the time and Antoine was getting coached by, I think John Meadows at the time. Mm -hmm. So like that process and then getting up there. And I remember like when I got to, uh, I remember doing a video at nationals and being like, yeah, so like, I remember leaving. Cause I remember like two weeks before nationals, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get information from Greg. And I'm like, you know, kind of like trying to like get him to give me some more information because this guy had like strided glutes. And I'm like, that's what you need to win. Cause he was like shredded on, on stage. And I was trying to get information from him. He's like, hey man, he's like, look, man, you can hire me if you want, blah, 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 blah. He's like, like, he's, if I were you, I, I wouldn't do the show. You're not lean enough. And I'm like, I'm like, this, this guy, mm -hmm. hindsight was right. I wasn't lean enough. But I was like, buddy, I'll like, I, I was 8% body fat before. He's like, there's no way. I'm like, I'll do 10 hundred, I'll do, I'll just do 10 hundreds. That's how I did it last time. I do 10 hundreds and blah, blah, blah. He's like, if you can do 10 hundreds, you're not in shape enough. And I'm like, whatever. I did 10 hundreds. I truly trained for two weeks and did 10 hundreds. I got the information I needed from him. And it was like, basically, you got to do way more cardio. So I was like, the only way I knew how to get the, the weight off and get it as shredded as I thought. And that he was the first person 
when I came off stage, he's like, Hey man, you should be really happy. You got second call out. I'm like, what's that mean? He's like, that's really good. I'm like, oh. And I remember making a video. I'm like, yeah. So apparently I'm looking at maybe like second call out, I think. I think I got like seventh or eighth. And I played, I placed eighth. And it was a stacked class. And I missed my weight class by a by a pound. So I was that was 226. I was supposed to be 225 or under. So I would have probably placed higher and better with the with the heavyweights. And um, Zane won his class that year. Greg won um, light heavy. Antoine won open. I mean, won uh, super heavy. And I was super heavy. So being against all those guys, I'm like, okay, so this is where I'm at. And I knew that I really didn't know or have all the information I needed. And then I did my second prep on my own. I ran into a dude who found me. It was, a, it was, this is right at the beginning of like social media time, right? Like not the beginning, but like, you know, 2012 was when in like Instagram was really starting to really take off. And a buddy of mine, Majid, he's from um, Saudi Arabia. He knew Chris Isito, like he tread, like he knew the, all these guys. And he came to St. Mary's to school. And he, when he came to say, to Canada, he was like, he was looking for somebody who bodybuilt. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I was looking for someone. And they said, and he messaged me, he's like, hey, so, uh, someone said that I should look for you for bodybuilding. They said, you're really serious about bodybuilding. I'm like, all right, yeah, for sure. And he was the first person to really kind of like open my eyes to, you know, the ins and outs of bodybuilding. He was friends with Big Ram at the time. Like he knew him before mm -hmm. Big Ram was Big Rammy. Like he was, Big Ram was just like the guy who just was a phenom freak that wasn't a pro yet. Yeah. So like he, he showed me all these guys and, and having his type of, you know, the mentality of from Middle Eastern when it comes to bodybuilding is like, mm -hmm. it's on another level, right? So it's, uh, our training was, it was my first, like, you know, he's my first bodybuilding training partner. And it was like, it was awesome. It was amazing. And how was it different than what you were doing? It was like, it had more direction. So like I was, I was training for, to build my chest to make, I wasn't just like, before I was just training muscle groups to get them bigger yeah. i was doing higher reps i was swinging weight you know i was using still using a lot of, like basically what i did was i used everything i was doing for, for football and it had you know it was 10 minimum reps yeah so i was doing like you know heavy deads i was doing like four plate stiff like deadlifts for like 15 20 reps and like ballistic and that's one yeah picks, basically yeah so you just added more volume I added, yeah, yeah i just added volume so when it came to him it was like we got to target this we got to target this i'm like oh, okay so this is how you this is how you train for bodybuilding. So we, you know, we, you know, we put a plan together. I ended up winning my, the next year um, by like a long shot. And then um, I came second to, uh, to Zane in heavyweight. And then I, at that time, I qualified for Arnold's. So my first year at Nationals, I was like, you know, how do you become a pro? Like, what are the steps you have to take? You have to win overall, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, what's the next show I can do that I, have, I can be? with the best. Cause like, that's, I, you know, I'm coming from a football yeah. background. I, you know, I'm on a team that's been like the best I've, I've only trained like, you know, my training in my, my mindset was like, I'm a professional athlete. I'm trained to be a professional athlete. So in this realm, what do you have to do to be a professional athlete? So at that point there was like, you know, so like you do the Arnold's and I'm like, and I asked like, can I do the Arnold's here? It's like, you know, you can't, you have to play, you have to place top five to do the Arnold's at that time. So the year that I placed second, Oh, sorry, third qualified for me, the Arnold's and the Arnold go, from the national, from that year, my second nationals, I was like, okay, I can be a pro, but it wasn't until Hiritada and, um, oh my God, I don't, I hate that. I forgot his name. Just a blunt mind fart. Um, he was a Olympia three years ago. He's in Kuwait. Hardy? No. Um, open four years ago. Oh my God, he's in Kuwait all the time. He's like, he's, he's always been aesthetically amazing. His legs oh, are smaller, shit. but he built his legs finally. He's won like once or twice. Anyway. Yeah, it will come to me. Oh my later. God, sorry. It will come sorry. to me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But he was like, I was there. I remember it's passing. It was my first um, Olympia. And, um, and uh, he was like, uh, what show are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing Arnold. He's like, oh yeah. It's like, he's like, cool. I'm like, yeah. It's a the Arnold Amateur. He's like, you're not a pro yet? I'm like, no. I'm like, Okay. And then the next booth I went to, I, I was talking about bodybuilding and he thought I was a pro. And I'm like, I guess I can probably be a pro in this thing. Like it was getting more clear because now I have actual professionals that are telling me and all these guys, I was reading magazines. I, as soon as I got into bodybuilding, it was like 
give me the magazines, give me whatever I can get my hands on and, and study this sport. I need to know if I can do what's realistic. And that made it realistic for me. It was like hearing from them. And at that time as well, too, like Aaron, I met Aaron Clark and Aaron Clark was prepping for his first Arnold's and I was prepping for the Arnold Amateur and we prepped together, uh, like, you know, online and whatnot. So it was like after my second nationals, my first nationals, I knew I, I, I wanted to. It was like, this is a sport that I want to do and I'm going to pursue. It was my next year at nationals. I knew that I can, I can get that, like, you know, I can do this thing. But then my, at the, that year at the Olympia, it was like, it was confirmation galore. It was just like, you can do this. You can, you know, seeing him in person was one of the things like, you know, you watch magazines, look at magazines, you're reading it. You're like, yeah, that guy's massive and they are massive. Yeah. But then you, you know, you don't look at yourself the same way until you have someone that's already there mistake you for one of them. And I was very conscious of that. So I was very like conscious of like what people were saying and, you know, the words, you know, just like this, the, uh, you know, the, the conversations and, you know, the, the rumors and, you know, so it, it led me to believe that I could actually do this thing at that point. So it was, it was that bodybuilding fully submerged and I was like a top two every year. At what point did you start doing a deep dive into all this, the training, the nutrition, recovery and all that? That was, uh, at Majid. When I, after I met him, it was, after I met him, it was, it was all in because he challenged me. Like he really challenged me to, um, to really like understand this work. Cause like I knew it from some degree, but I didn't have, you know, like I had, like, you know, I had coaches and whatnot and they did the best they could for it, you know, but they, I didn't have anyone. He was the first per, like he was, he wasn't a coach, but he was like, in hindsight, he, he was. Cause the next person I got that was like a coach like him was Neil. And, and I, Greg did coach me, but like the, the, like, the, I would say the mindset, you know, example, like being a good example of like what bodybuilding is, the bodybuilding life, you know, eat, sleep, dream bodybuilding, you know, measuring everything to a T, you know, being in the gym, rest, everything. Like I fully submerged in it with him. And then when I got, you know, when I started moving on, I had that really good base from that. And then, um, co Greg coached me the year that the year I won. Um, my provincials should be state. Um, Greg's roommate was moving out, and I was like, "Yeah, look, you need to coach me. It's gonna be good for you and it'll good for me." He's like, "Well, you want? Why don't you just move in? My roommate's moving out. I'll coach you for free, and he's been a roommate." So I moved in with him, and he helped in that. And I was already like a coach at the time too. I was like, "I was a certified and whatnot." And then those conversations really you know, opened me up about like other ways of dieting and whatnot. And then it's when I got with Neil Hill that I was like, it was like next level for me. Like, yeah. Well, there, there's a difference between those that are just the athletes that here's your plan, do that. Then they just buckle down and do it. Yeah. And then those that will do that. But at the same time, want to understand why. Yeah. Yeah. All that yeah. is. Yeah. And you fall into that category. Yeah. Whereas why do you think you fall into that category? It's a, uh, so it's like, I always say like, I've never stopped playing football. Like, even though I was, I'm, I'm bodybuilding, I've never, and mindset has never been, like, it's never left me. And there's always this thing that we, that coach would always say is like, do your job. Like, just do your job. And doing your job meant like, you know, here's your assignment. Know your assignment. Like, your, your job is to do what you have to do. Don't do the guy next to you's job. You have a specific thing to do that's going to help the collective. So when it came to bodybuilding, I was always like, I need to know how to do this thing and why I'm doing this thing. Cause like, it was the same, like it was, it came to like football it was like, why am I doing a, uh, you know, why am I angle pedaling? Well, it's going to give me better leverage on my, on my receiver. Right. Why do my steps matter running back? What's going to give me better timing for the hole? So I was always like, why I was, I always want to know why certain things. So that translated over to football, over to bodybuilding. Cause I was always trying to find like, okay, why? And that's the same way I train right now is like, is like, why and what is necessary for me to be the best I can be at whatever I'm doing. And, um, when it came to like, you know, Majid was good. He knew enough of what he knew. Greg was good, but he knew a lot of what he knew. But Neil was like the guy that was like, you know, I want to know how to do all this stuff. And he took the time to really, you know, tell me like how this whole thing works, why we're doing a certain thing, you know, why you, you know, why we eat, why we're eating more clean, why we're being more consistent with certain things, why we have to be more consistent in the off season you know, when we're eating, we can't eat junk in the off season. There's a reason why some people lose their appetite in the off season. You know what I mean? 
So mm-hmm. a lot of things that I, the answers that I needed, um, especially even with training, uh, I got a lot of that from Neil and that, yeah. It's, um, the reason I point that out is it's a way to fast track where you want to go to. Yeah. 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 Because not everything's going to work the same way for everybody. Yeah, yeah. But if you know why it's supposed to work, yeah. you can make those pivots yeah. to be able to make it work. But a lot of people never figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I guess it would be the same way with football or any other sport. Yeah. You know, if they're just doing what they're supposed to do, but they're not trying to figure out why, well, life hits, yeah. things change. And then if they don't know why, they don't know what the hell to do because yeah. all they know is that one way. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, and that's rare. You know, in bodybuilding, it's rare. In powerlifting, it's rare. In all strength sports, it's a rare attribute. Yeah, um, it's more rare today than than ever before, yeah, right? Yeah. Because there are more coaches, which is a good thing. Yeah, but a lot of those coaches aren't doing what you're talking about and trying to educate the athlete. Yeah, and I get it because it takes more time. Yeah, and you have to have the athlete that wants to be educated. Yeah, or sometimes you won't have that. Yes, you yeah. know, then as you as a coach, you don't want to waste your time, you know, on that if they really don't care about it anyhow. Yeah, yeah. So with, with that trajectory, then if I said that correctly. <laughs> um, when did you think, cause you never really figure it out, but when do you think you had a good handle on it? I would say, I would definitely say after the, the Arnold um, amateur 2016. Um, and you'll coach me for that, for that show. And, and honestly, like I can, people say all the time, but like, I could, I, sh- Neil's almost like, what the heck? Like I should have won that show. And it was, it was, uh, the, the, the gentleman that runs the other, um, the other league, I think mm-hmm. league now, he was the head guy. And one of the guys in my class were great friends with the family and he should not have won. He should have at least been second. And he was even really, he, he was even surprised. We're still friends with today. Um, but it was that, it was that show. I was, you know, I was with, I was, I was with um, John Meadows in, uh, in sitting in bed with John and uh, Neil was coaching me and me and John. And I was sitting on the bed with John and just talking to him about bodybuilding. And it was like, that was one of the, my favorite memories. Cause I was sitting like, as I remember like, pre, before that, you know, I, I knew of John and watching, you know, Mountain Dog training yeah. and, and Antoine and Santan and I'm like, like all these guys from the area and coached by this guy and his systems and everything else. And I, and I gravitate a lot to it. Cause I like, cause like a lot of the training too, is like very, everyone has like this, like everyone, we, we all kind of do the same thing, but our own little spin on, on a certain mm-hmm. thing and our way of like conceptualizing it or applying it to someone else makes it, it like very unique to each individual or each coach. So you gravitate a lot. So when I was sitting, when I was sitting with them and we we're both like ready for our getting ready for a show, I was like, just that conversation with him was like, you know, I'm here and like, this is what I want to do. Like, this is exactly what I want to do. I remember Will walked in after, um, and I'm sitting in there as an amateur with like, you know, John metals peeled out of his mind. I'm like, I need to be like, that's what lean is. And I'm like, and I see John, um, you know, uh, Will Bonac and he was very similar shape for me. I have a little small waist, but like, he was very like, you know, I can really, I looked up to him and I'm in this place. Like, like, I don't want to do anything else but this. And like, I got to find a way to do this for the rest of my life. And that was, that was the, uh, that was it right there. That I was like fully, like full on. Like I knew the passion was like, it was, the passion was there. Like the passion was there after the first show. I was like, I enjoyed it. Cause I like, I like hard. Like for me, like I'm a workhorse. So I, all that bodybuilding, it just, it, it pulls people like me in. Mm-hmm. Like I want to work really, really hard. Here's a challenge. Go to this challenge. And it's one of the hardest things to do, to be honest, like dieting. And and sustaining muscle might sound like very like ease, but it, it is absolutely it's hard. Yeah. And and I enjoy it. I like the I like being tired and having to dig myself out of exhaustion to train. That shit gets my blood going. I'm an adrenaline junkie. Like I love it. So like the passion grew and then I remember I remember when Neil if I even hired Neil. I put a I put a um true story. I was uh, supposed to do the <laughs> it's hilarious actually. I was supposed to do the um, Arnold Brazil, I think. I forget what Arnold it was. Because um, I, I just finished doing the other Arnold. Not Arnold, sorry. Um, another show. I was, I was going to do the other Arnold, actually. This is before Neil. And Greg was coaching me. And I was like, well, let's do the um, Olympia Amateur that's in Cancun. And I remember being like, I don't know if you'd be ready for that. 
And I was like, I took so much offense to that. I'm like, I'm like, you understand what kind of athlete I am? Like, you tell me what to do, I'm going to do it. Like, I'll just do my job. So your job is not to tell me what I can't do. Your job is to get me prepared for it. Yeah. I don't care if there's two weeks left to it or it's not, you know, achievable in your stand. It's, and for me, I'm going to do it. So I was bitter. I was just like, what the heck? And I'm like, let's just take a break for a minute. And then I had a, I had a post and I tagged Neil in this post, like, you know, a few weeks after. And he messaged me back and I was watching Game of Thrones. And I was like, I'm like, Neil Hill, I'm like, message me. I'm like, what the heck? And I was like, I messaged him back and we started talking. And I was like, holy shit, Neil Hill is coaching me. So it, it, it was that, it was, it was from there that my training even got that much more, you know, um, tuned in terms of like, you know, if you hear anybody say muscle mind connection, I always remember muscle mind connection from like, you know, you know, uh, flex, iron. Yeah. muscle mind yeah, connection, yeah. muscle mind connection. It was always that. And, and watching, you know, flex's videos, watching, you know, all these guys' videos, but it was more so of flex and Neil, they were talking about all about this muscle mind connection. I knew what it was, but it, they, they were fully submerged in it, you know, slower rep ranges, full range of motion. Yeah. 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 And so when I had him as a coach, I was already training specifically as a bodybuilder to build muscle, hypertrophy, yada, yada. But he tuned it even more. I trained hard. Like there's, there's, I can train, I'll, I'll train until my arms are broke. He brought something out of me that I didn't know that I had. And it was like a gut check for me. I was like, I, after training with him, it was like, I know hard I can actually train. So after that, it was like, I knew that I can't go back to how I was training before. And you know, coincidentally too, that's when my, my static started acting up for the first time was that prep, my back, I had deteriorating vertebrae in my L4 and L5 also fight sitting in my static. And um, I, I couldn't, my, my leg, my hamstring, my hand, my left hamstring basically turned off one day. And I was in bed, just like in absolute agony, crying and laughing at the same time. Got x-rays, found out what it was. And Neil's, you know, Neil's, his philosophy of his training, basically slowly shit down, get rid of the ego connect to the muscle properly, et cetera. Um, that's when I really was like, I need to do this a lot more often. Because at that point, I, the dog was like, you can't squat anymore. Like, I'm like, that's not, that's your solution at the squat anymore? Like, no, I'm sorry, I'm squatting. So I, I peel back all my weights. I literally cut everything down by like 50%. Started from the beginning of, every, of, of all my lifts, worked on range of motion, worked on connecting even more. And at the same time, I was like full, like that year was my first year I was actively going, into, I was active in therapy. So while I'm learning about this, like, well, I'm really getting submerged into muscle mind connection. I was in therapy learning how to, to be, um, be in, uh, aware, be present. So I'm, I'm going through, you know, I did dialectal behavioral therapy and a lot of uh, the body scans we did and the, the mindfulness exercise we did was basically muscle mind connection. And when I was trying to like figure this thing out and trying to be in the moment, because my issue was way too far in the past or way too far in the future, worrying about something, it'd be triggered and I'd be spiraling in the present. And I remember one session, I was like, wait a minute, I do this all the time in the gym. Like muscle mind connection is being self-aware and this is being in the moment, it's being you know mindful. So I would translate all of this. I do my practicing of being in the moment with my muscle mind connection. So like my goal was to like intertwine these two things. And I saw the benefits of this muscle mind connection, basically slow your shit down, feel the muscle be present, take over my life in the most like positive way. Cause it allowed me to have this outlet that I have like every single day. Cause I was training like, you know, six days a week and I'm in the gym all the time. So it's like, I get to practice this mindfulness thing that's at the same time helping me build muscle. And I made some of the best, changes of my career between that time and now so when you went into that time it's kind of an ego blow too yeah. right because you got to drop all the weight yeah so how did you lean into that because we can show people this yeah right so they can press 150 pound dumbbells or you can press 80 yeah you know and it's a big difference yeah and you can show them but then two weeks later they're right back to the 150s again yeah so how did you stay in that zone to be able to do that? It's so I think it's, I think it's the fact that I was, you know, so present when I'm doing it that I enjoyed it like a lot, but then I also saw the benefits of it. Right. So like I knew that 
for the for the for the for the, for the most part, my I had to do that because my back was was yeah. effed. like I had to like there's like you can't like you're you can either not squat or you can you know be a lot more you know you know tuned in your in your technique you know core engagement i was never using my like i was my core would be engaged but it would be you know i my yeah. gut would be out i have the belt completely yeah. racked right on and you know compress my spine and you know my brace was okay but it was, still wasn't a, it wasn't a proper brace so like i had to so i didn't it's not like i had a choice um but i knew the benefits that i of of it immediately well, with that movement, yes, but when you get into tricep extension, curls and stuff, pull downs, lats, yeah, no. So, right, it it was a because I did go like I like tr like yeah. trust me, I did go like it was a you know I did go back and forth, okay, but it was like a it was a it was the evolution thing. It was, you know, I would say like sixty percent of the time I was, you know, keeping things at mm -hmm. bay, egos out of the door, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like seventy, eighty. You know as it go up and it came the more i saw results because again like too i was also very minimalist when it came to you know anabolics a very mm -hmm. minimalist um so when i it and i was very aware and when i started training like that more the more i saw the change in my body happen like very very fast like my like a chest of my like my chest was never it still isn't the best my best muscle group but it was an obvious it was an obvious like you know um weakness that when I started to train properly, like, you know, and, and peel the weight back and took my reps longer and slower, I could see the changes happen in my body, like almost like within, like within the month. It wasn't like a massive change, but because I was so, I was practicing being aware and being present, I could see those changes happening. And then when I would kind of go back to like, you know, I'm like, oh, let me try and go back to that weight again. I was pressing heavier weight. So I was like, holy shit, wait a minute. Like, so when I slow this weight down, and I progressive overload with a smaller weight, and I decided to go back to the heavier weight. I'm actually getting stronger faster than I was before. Mm -hmm. um, than you know, than just throwing up 150s for seven, seven, eight reps fast. Now I'm doing like 120s slow, and that was like to me that was like really fun for me. Like I liked the, I like that. That's more rewarding to me. Training, seeing like a guy like Nick Walker take heavy ass weight, you know. Um, Ian Valer, I like seeing guys that are like, I used to be like, that was 265, at, you know, you know, a few years ago. So seeing bigger guys move weight, like almost like meticulously, you know, with like almost like a melody when you're watching them. Yeah. That, that was like, I'm like, that is strength. That is control. And that's what kind of like led me to, you know, and I follow a lot of guys who were very muscle mind connection esque, um, you know, there was Neil and then under Neil, there was, you know, Matt Jansen was around and then, you know, every, like you could, you could probably track everything from like, you know, all, most of all of Matt Jansen's guys to Neil, you know, when Dallas McCarver was with us, he was, you know, it was around Neil yeah. and flex. And, you know, so I saw a lot of guys that I looked up to that I respected as athletes and they were, and they happened to just be athletes who are, who came from the same kind of background. They played football, you know? So for me, it was like, I'm watching these guys take their, like control the ego. I think you can have an ego, you just gotta control it yeah. the right way. Well, with the strength athletes, one of the things that I try to preach to them is you can train an extra, you can train a movement or you can train a muscle, Yeah. right? So if they have hypertrophy work in their strength program, to me, it makes no sense to be doing a side raise with 80 pound dumbbells. Yeah. If they can use a side raise with 20 pound dumbbells, yeah. take the momentum away, slow the tempo down and get more out of it. There's less joint wear and tear yeah, yeah, because of all that, but they fight back about it all the time. And it's, if they look at what the, I, I'm hesitant to say majority, but mo close to the majority of all bodybuilders, that's how they train. Yeah. You know, and it's, if you want, and they're the specialists that building muscle hypertrophy. Yeah, yeah. That's their thing. Yeah. You know, and it, it's, it's mind blowing to me that they won't do that. And they have limited volume yeah. that they're working with in the first place, yeah. which would kind of dictate in my brain, make sure it's done that way yeah. because you don't have as much volume as what a bodybuilder would have. Yeah. Yeah. But they all go back to, I call it muscle fucking weight. They just go back to muscle <laughs> yeah. fucking weight, yeah. you know, cause it looks yeah. better on Instagram or whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. And it's, but it's interesting to hear you say that when you would go back and put the momentum and acceleration into it, you were stronger. 
yeah. you know, because of doing it that other way, yeah. which just reinforces what I'm trying to tell all yeah. them from the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a freaking side raise or a push down. It's not like something that's going to build your bench up. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's to build muscle, yeah. you know, and it's low hanging fruit that they yeah. just screw up. And a lot of young bodybuilders do as well. Yeah. Because they're chasing that more weight. Yeah. Which they kind of need to in a way. Yeah. But which the question I would ask then is if you go back earlier in your training and if that's how you train from the onset of when you cared about bodybuilding. Yeah. <clears throat> would you have progressed at a faster rate or do you think that you had to have that time where you were just hanging and banging heavy weight? I love, I love that question because I, I look at just even the last two years um of how i've been training and i say like i if i knowing what i know now i would have probably looked the same or better if i would have trained like this from the jump like 100 percent. like and, and i know like I, this question has been asked well the, you know the hypothetical question has been asked about like someone like ronnie coleman yeah and it's like genetics or genetics like you're gonna like your, your muscle you're you're gonna you're gonna you're either good at you're good at building muscle some muscle parts grow better than others but if you have good genetics, you're going to get the results. Now, I'm a huge believer and just in, and, and seeing this happen in the last, like, I would say f five years, um, that when your body is in harmony, it's going to grow better, right? Like if I, if my body is not, uh, not healing the joint as well as the muscle, it's going to, you know what I mean? Like if, if you can, like my body was going through trauma, you know, l ballistically lifting. You know, I remember like, you know, training biceps and like my tendons are hurting. Like, why are my tendons hurting? You know, like I train now, you know, with intensity, I'm a lot smarter about it and I'm able to sustain the look I have right now, even training for the Olympia, the Masters Olympia. Like I did that gear free. Like I haven't been on anything for two years, like zero zip zulch. And that just reinforced that my, the training I've been doing was enough to you know, to still mitigate great gains or even sustain the muscle that I had. So it's like, if I was in the environment where I was, when I was 28 years old, cause that's when I started using, um, and started bodybuilding. If I would have started to train like that from the, from the get go, I would have, I would hundred percent believe I would have had a better overall physique. I would have grown better. I would have grown faster, more efficiently. You know, um, yeah. so how do you how do you take that message then and work with your own clients to have compliance? It's a well, I, I mean, like I give them self anecdotes. I I tell them like you know it's and there's a, there, and I find like there's a lot more now bodybuilders out there that are preaching the same thing. Um, but at the same time, like I I I reinforce like when I I give this same spiel with all my athletes, it's I call out my athletes, clients, athletes. It's empowering, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um. I always say, like, you know, I, like I, I say, like, I haven't stopped playing football. For me, the best relationship that I, that I know of is a quarterback and the coach. I'm like, look at Bill Belichick and, and Tom Brady. Bill Belichick knows the game inside out, and so does Tom Brady. But Bill Belichick can't see the field. Tom Brady can't. When they're on the same page, that's when things, that's when magic happens. So we need to speak the same language. So learn, like, I want you to ask questions. I want you to know, I want you to know why you're doing exactly what you're doing so that when the results are happening, you know why they're happening. So there's no like, you know, oh, I, I gained muscle for something. Like, you know, there's, you, you make it, a, you know, make it, you make a change and you have no clue what happened. You think it's just because you, you know, you might've been eating something or, or, you know, or you're doing a certain exercise. It's like, no, it's, you're properly moving and the results are coming because you're fueling it properly. Like you're, you're, you're optimal in both, in both ways. You're training in a way where your body's in harmony. And you're eating the way where you're feeding the body in harmony. And all of a sudden you're getting results for that. And on a week to week basis, we do is like, there's three things that I, that I always look at is training, supplementation, nutrition, right? And training is going to be like, you know, your cardio and your, um, you know, uh, in your, your cardio and your training, your supplementation is going to be like, you know, whatever it can be anabolic or it can be over the counter. It could be creatine. It could be your fat burner. It could be planner or whatever. Right. Yeah. And then your, um, nutrition and on a week to week, um, you know, I have asked, I have asked them a few questions that they answer, but at the same time, like I won't change certain things. I only change one thing at a time. And they don't. And so if I, you know, if we have a hit a plateau of some sort, then, you know, say we're losing weight or for a show or just losing weight, whatever. And, and I change one thing say like, we're going to add 10 minutes of cardio this week. 
that's it. And then we see a change. We know that, hey, it was probably the 10 minutes of cardio that we changed, yeah. right? And then they're like, oh, there's results. We're seeing that happen. So they're always like my biggest like flex is like my athletes can coach a coach. We spend a lot of time talking about why you're doing a certain thing. And, and I think that's the thing that, that needs to happen with coaches. I think good coaches, that's what I learned with, like, with Neil is like the athletes that are really good are the ones that know why they're doing certain things and know what they're doing, like what they're doing and why they're doing it and the results are happening and they know why the results are happening. So when you, when you go through that process of application and, and they're basically they're their own test subjects and they're fully aware of what's going on, it's easier for them to stay on, on track because there's an accountability aspect of that because you're giving them work to do with themselves. But then you're also reinforcing them to be aware of why they're doing a certain thing. And then they're seeing, okay, this is happening. We've changed this. This is happening. You know, I used to train this way before and now I'm training with you or training like this. I've never felt my chest like, like ever. I've, and I've trained a lot of powerlifters who are absolutely animals, like respect this, like, you know, way stronger than I am. Then you're like, I've never trained hypertrophy like this before. Like now my chest is hurting like it's never hurt before. Like it's a different system. Mm -hmm. You're not going you're not gonna feel the same way because there's, there's there's two different out, like in a, a outputs for this that are happening. That's why one you're training specifically to grow muscle, one you're training spe specifically to get stronger. We're just we're just changing the environment, and now you're seeing the results of that environment that you're in happen on a week to week basis. Now you're you're feeling the you know the results of this system, and then you're not only feeling it, there you're seeing it, and then you're aware of it. And that's way easier to keep people on than just being like, here's your plan. And then like, you know, you made a change. They have no clue. They, you know, here's a new plan you have this week. And then like, all right, thanks. And then they're doing their own thing anyway. I coach them too. I, they, I make them, they send me videos. So I make sure that I'm watching what they do and, and they're training. Like, I'll tell them like, you need to train harder. Like your rep speed, like look at your first rep, look at your last rep. Great range of motion, great tempo, great technique. But your first and fourth rep look like your last fourth, you know, your yeah. last, you know, whatever, first or third rep, whatever. That needs to, you need to add weight. Like add like five pounds, 10 pounds, whatever it is, you know, yeah. for that person. So like I'm always going through a system where it's like, it's, I'm taking a lot of what I've done in my life in terms of like just being aware. Like be present when you're training. Know why you're doing a certain thing. And you're going to see the results. So you're not guessing of why something's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to use the restroom real quick. And then we'll come back. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Elite FTS was founded in 1998 with the aim to live, learn, and pass on. We've done this through training related content that allows you to become the strongest athlete and coach that you can. Over the past two decades, actually two and a half decades, we've published more complimentary training media than anybody else in the industry. When you look at the number of articles, the Q and A's, the blogs, the videos, the podcasts, there's over a million pages of content that we've put out there. We've been able to do this through your support of Elite FTS. So when you purchase Elite FTS strength equipment, bands, accessories, gear, apparel, or anything through the site, you directly help support the content that we put out, which in turn helps support other people on their journey of becoming stronger and better coaches. So stronger athletes and better coaches, which encompasses the aim and the vision to live, learn, and pass on. So I thank you for the support that you've been giving for the past 25 years and encourage you to keep supporting Elite FTS into the future so we can all help more people become better and stronger. Discount code Table Talk for 10% off your first order. All right, guys, if you like the Table Talk podcast, then you're going to love the crew. If you're struggling with trying to get through a sticking point, you're trying to figure some specific aspect of your training out that you just can't dial in, you're dealing with injuries, you're trying to figure out how to better optimize your training. All the stuff you're seeing on social media is confusing and all you need is a little guidance and support or just somebody to look at your lifts to make sure that they're either heading in the right, right direction or if there's a weak point in the lift, they can point out what that weak point is. Well, that's what we have the crew for. So when you join the crew, you get an extra Table Talk podcast each month called the Crewcast. You also get access to our Discord community, which has a training Q&A, form checks with top coaches, 
mindset section, nutrition, training logs, programs, over 30 ebooks, plus exclusive ebooks just for the crew, webinars, lectures, seminars, giveaways from ranging from full strength equipment. We've given away many yoke bars this year. We've given away actually pieces of strength equipment as well as accessory items and you get exclusive crew discounts. So go to the link in the description that says join the crew, click it, join now and start getting stronger today. All right guys, we've got a new limited edition drop, the original Mountain Dog Tee that John Meadows had us design from the very beginning. So it's the first tee that he had made. Once again, this is a limited edition item. So when they're gone, they're gone. While I have your attention, you've seen me wear this one in a few podcasts to date. We've been holding back on it. This here, the four star T, I think that's what we call it. It's on the website, new items, also under limited edition. Check out our shoulder saver pads. It's an easy way to do limited restricted range of motion exercises like board press that basically you just pop the pad on the bar, reduces the range of motion, pop it back off when you're done. Thank you guys for the support. Head over to EliteFTS.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything that you need and nothing that you don't. In other words, no sugar, no artificial coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, and no BS. With Element, I love the watermelon. The watermelon tastes freaking awesome. I drank one pack every day, no matter what, people that train out here, it's sitting out here for them all the time. The boxes don't last very long. Right now, Element is offering Table Talk listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packages free with any Element order. Get yours at drinkelement.com backslash table talk. The deal is only available through the link in the description. The other thing is if you don't like it, you can just give it away to a salty friend and Element will give you a 100% refund no risk money back guarantee head over to drinkelement.com backslash table talk Fumeric health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym improve recovery sex drive and quality of life have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder stereotyped or just told as part of getting older just go to americhealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years or you can use their guided optimization with this they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventive and medicine standpoint after that conversation they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done and then from there get the labs done they'll review those labs with with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The discount code is table talk. All right, we're back. Let's pivot the topic into mental health because you've touched on that a couple times already and you do motivational work, speaking work, and you know, advocate for mental health. So to start, how would you define that? Being, just being, I got this thing, I came with this thing a little bit called uh, Shout Out Your Soul, S-O-L. So suffer out loud. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's just being like, like not being ashamed of, you know, what you went through, what you're going through. Uh, and just being an advocate of being, being open and vulnerable about it. I think that's the, one of the biggest things. Like you don't have to go and, I think people think of like being an advocate they think you have to be like, you know, like a, uh, um, uh, Eric Thomas or something in front of a big, huge audience. I think it just, just being like open, like, Hey, like I am going through this and just saying that, you know, brings in conversations that other people like, Oh shoot, you too. Okay. So now I can talk about it. And that's the biggest thing I think is just getting people to talk about it. Um, and not being scared to talk about it and giving them a safe space. So I think like the, being an advocate to start is just like, you know, owning it, you know, and like, it's, it's part of your, it's part of your life. You, you know, it's something that you're working on. And, uh, yeah, I think it's the biggest thing to just talk. So with you being in therapy for a while, right. Yeah. Cause it, I mean, it kind of goes back. <clears throat> what were some of the pivotal moments 
through that to where you realized that this is something that you need to work on, right? Because you can have somebody that has issues and throw them in therapy and yeah. like, fuck this thing. You know, they're, yeah. they're not doing anything until they actually see that it's actually helping. Yeah. I think the, I think there's a couple parts. There's, there's one, like, I've been through some, so I used to cut when I was younger. Um, and, and I had like great coaches in high school. So a little back even more. My, I come from a very, my mom and dad are old. My mom's 80, my dad's 84. Um, reverend family, not too much about mental health back in the day. So if anything is going on, it's like pray for him mm -hmm. type thing, right? So it wasn't like, you need to go to therapy. It's like, pray for that guy. It's like, well, he's doing some. So I went to, I remember the first time I was I, there. One of the instances I've actually went for help. I actually, you know, I was in the, my, my coaches saw my arm and I was like, what happened to you? I'm like, ah, oh, a cat scratched me. It's like, kind of cat scratch you. <laughs> and I remember just being in the office one day. I was like, I need help. And I started crying. And I was like, I think I was like 17. And I was like, I need help. And um, that was the first kind of stint into my first little appearance into therapy. I went and got, you know, I went through a diagnosis process and it was very like vague. Um, and then, you know, again, it was like in university, you know, it, it was, you know, during, you know, my uh, being in, in Whistler, I was like, I need to figure it out. You know, I've always had, and I can, you know, I can say like my mom and dad's programming was like, you know, in, in me, it was more so of like, there's so you, my mom's always saying like, you're here for a purpose. There's a reason God has a plan for you. So that program has always been in my head that like, there's something you have to. So for me, I was, I had, I was, I had the willingness to want help. And as I'm basically getting at the first thing I was like, I want help. I knew that you know, there's parts of my life that I was just getting sick and tired of being the same place. I'm like, here I'm again in the same thing. And I remember my buddy, my, one of my good friends, Owen, he's like, he's like, wherever you go, there you will be. Mm -hmm. the, first, the last thing he said to me before I left Whistler is like, it's not the place, it's the person. So if you're going to go somewhere thinking that you're going to change, like get that out of your head. And he was right on that. So for me, it was like to a point where I remember it was, um, I was in, I was uh, bodybuilding, I was, you know, I was, uh, 2014 this is my 10th year in therapy and i go like now like for he's like my it's a mandatory for me i it's my he's my brain coach um i got a consultant i got a therapist and they're great but it was like i remember the first time being there i was like i want to be a jedi in my mind i i want to control this thing i knew that i was a very impulsive person you know i had issues with like you know interpersonal relationships and work and you know um just a sense of self and whatnot so for me it was like i was like i want to figure this out it's, it's at the point, even being in bodybuilding, you know, I had an outlet, but the thing about bodybuilding too, was it was the first time things were really quiet, like very quiet. So like football was loud, you know, there's cheers, there's audience, there's people talking, there was, I was out somewhere, there was community stuff, there was something always to do. There is team. Bodybuilding was like, you're on a stepper for two hours. And you're like, you know, there's, there's, it's just you, it's just you and your thoughts. And it, and it was, and it was very alarming to me that I was in a place I was still, I was still, there was still that piece of me. And I remember going through addictions counseling. The part that scared me was we were started talking about depression and I was like, whoa, depression. Ah, cause I know depression means pills and stuff. And I'm not doing that cause I already have an issue with, so I kind of like shied away from that. And I got the addiction part under control, but the other part of that, of my life wasn't handled. And I was spiraling a lot in terms of like, like feeling like extreme depression, like very, very suicidal. You can bleep that out if you have to, but like very, um, you know, attempt. And I remember, um, at the time I was sitting with, um, my girlfriend who was my nut wife. Now I was, uh, we moved in together and I was like, I suffer from depression and I was cutting at the time still. And we, uh, called a, um, the crisis mobile. Um, support got me the phone luckily and that again still like it's, it's at this point still I still uh, have a lien on my sin number so I still don't have like I'm still building up my life money wise so like you know bodybuilding was still this positive thing and environment but there's still like parts of my old life that were still like holding on holding back mm -hmm. so I luckily got into because in Canada like you know it, it's free <laughs> but it's not right so it's like <laughs> so this one was actually free and it was actually like it was Capital Health. It was like, you know, I was lucky to get into it. It was the uh, Belmont House. And the therapist that I got was, I still, still the same guy to today. He's absolutely awesome. 
but it was like I wanted to go. I knew there was something wrong, and I wanted to. I knew that a lot of the things going on in my head were stopping me from getting to the next place I needed to get to. Because in that time too, about even like I, I I picked up an eating disorder, which was like luckily I had a therapist because I was I was able to mitigate it because I had someone that was able to kind of like you know break it down for me of like why I'm going through these things. So I knew that I wanted to get help, and I knew that my success was going to be dictated by how much I can get my mental health under control because it was very destructive. Like my mental, like I I. I sometimes kind of almost breeze over it. It was a very, you know, I got was I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, and all the things that are I would say that that are under the umbrella of BPD or BBT, I had all of them, like all every one of them. You know, like the the you know fear of abandonment, um, the self harm, the um, you know reckless behavior, reckless driving, reckless you know. Um, uh, sexual inner whatever and all the all the things that that I was using to to kind of like cope with me you know all those things were destroying me and would never let me get to that to where I wanted to go because I saw this, this feeling so getting into it I knew that that needed to stop like that had to stop and that was stopping me from progressing so I saw the results of every time I went through a breakthrough a breakthrough happened with my life it was like on it was like literally like on par and yeah, it was, yeah, it was just, what do you mean by breakthrough? It, so I would, so I, I call it going down the rabbit hole. Like when you go through, like when you go to therapy and you want to like, you know, when you want to get through, when you're conscious of why you do a certain thing, my whole, my, my, my thing I always say was like, I want to know why I want to know why and my therapist is like, okay, I know you want to know why, but like what then when you know why, and that's the, that's going to be the thing that matters. Like now you know why you're doing it. What are you gonna do about it? So a lot of the stuff was like test stem from like early childhood trauma, and then how I cope with those things and how my life went from there. So there's a lot of like pain and healing that had to go. And one of the bigger things was like forgiving my father and my mother for you know certain in certain ways I was raised and understanding that process. And so when I was able to forgive my dad, it was like immediately, like it was. It, it felt like I was like not chained anymore. Like I was like more free, like emotionally. I wasn't as angry. And a lot of things that I would have in my life, I would I'd be triggered from something from the past. And one of my biggest triggers was were some of my, of, my, of my parents. So how does that process work? Because it's one thing to say that you forgive them, but it's <sighs> another thing to actually do it. Yeah, yeah. It's so a couple of things. It's like we always, we always mask a lot of forgiveness with like placing it on somebody else when it's like really you're trying to forgive yourself. And like, you know, letting yourself know that it's not your, you're not, it's not your fault, you know, or taking ownership to it, to, you know, or just letting like, whatever those things have happened, let it be, it, it happened. And then like, understanding why, like, you know, easy example, like my parents were, um, you would definitely call it abuse for sure. Now, hundred percent easily. And you know, like, it was a switch, it was a belt, it was anything. It was, you know, an extension, it was all the things that you would think of. But then when you're like, Okay, your parents are about a generation away from slavery. Like, yeah. let's be serious. Like, a lot of the parents, unfortunately, back then, um, black parents hit their kids a lot because it would keep them in line. Those are days of like, you know, Emmett Till. It's like mm -hmm. you're out of line, you can get killed if you don't, you don't say something smart. So, your parents are a couple generations, or even a generation from my grandfather was 87 when he died. He was a reverend, right? So, that kind of kind of behavior was all they knew. It's like that. That's just programming for them. Well, it's all they knew, and it may have been coming from the right place. Yeah, and that's and that's what it was too. It was like under like no like that was the most freeing thing ever because I was like going through that. It was like right before I had my daughter too. So like when I went through that process, understanding like oh I get it that you you guys were that you weren't just you weren't being mean. You were doing what you thought as a parent to protect me. Yeah, like I get that completely. And I remember sitting across my, I was one day I was sitting with my dad and unfortunately it was, it was um, in 2008, my father had a, uh, four strokes in like one sitting. And at that point he was just as fast as I was still. My dad was a freak athlete, like freak. He can run as fast as lightning, you know, scratch golfer, you know, 300 bowler, hockey player, everything. And he had a stroke. Um, he had to get brain surgery and it brought him, it like crippled him. 
So I watched this like man that was like, it's always this like, never seen him cry. He was like your man's man, mm -hmm. right? Like work 60 hours and then cut some of his grass and, and whatever else, have a lot of cash in his hand. <laughs> and um, I watched him go from this like, you know, just this man to like frail. And then it made him nice and it pissed me off. Like it, it made me so angry that he was just like this really kind man all of a sudden. And then I was, I found myself treating him sometimes like he would treat me. And then looking at him like he doesn't deserve that. And I remember sitting across from him and we were listening to um, the, uh, uh, the Temptations. Because he liked I, this, mm -hmm. his old record. Um, and we were listening to a song and he was singing, he was doing this. And, and I was doing this too. And I looked at him like, and I, I, I was like, holy shit, we're like the same person. And then I looked at him like, dad, I'm like, I want you to know that I'm not mad at you anymore. And I understand why you did what you did. And I love you. And that was like, and it was so hard for me to say that. But at the same time, I was like, it was like, he was like, I love you too. And he was like, I'm sorry. And after that, I was like, I get it. And then it was easy for me after that, for everything. It was like, it was, that was one breakthrough. And that was the same, like that, after that breakthrough, eating uh, the, the bulimia part, gone, like gone. Like I control, like it was, it was so much more control. It was like little breakthroughs like that, that happened. That like, you know, again, like it, it's hard to go through because like, it was like, it took me a good like year for me to like, you know, still be around him and not like, want to just like, yeah, like stop, like use your, like use your arm. Like your, your dad can't see from the peripheral and his arm doesn't work like that anymore. Pick up, the, pick up your fork, dad. Like, what are you doing? Like stop being, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of attitude and like being like, what are you doing? Like. Like, that's not the way, you know, it took me a bit to soften up because I was so used to seeing this like strong ass man. I'm like, I don't want to see this guy that I wanted forever. I don't see this nice dude that I didn't get. Like, and he was, wasn't a tyrant. Like, don't get me wrong. It wasn't a around, you know, he was hilarious. He was whatever, but he was just different time. He had, he had us when, you know, I should be in my fifties. Like I should be like, my youngest cousin is like 60, right? Like all of his brothers, his sisters, their kids are in their 50s so like my mom and dad had us way later and then i got brought up in a area with young parents and young kids so there was resentment galore as you know i was punished way harsher than other people you know all those things that i had to kind of come to terms with that um yeah it was like that was the one thing it was like that kind of gave me that uh that pivot in my life well some of that will create that aggressiveness yeah that you would have on the field Yes. Right. And then in training as well. Yeah. So after that breakthrough and that's gone, is that gone there too? No, no, someone, <laughs> no, it's, there's like, there's a, those, you know, you, there, you can't forget, you can, you can forgive what you never forget. Yeah. Right. But it's what you do with what you can't forget. So like I use it and like, when it comes to mental health, um, I think it's even with addictions, you don't get cured of mental health. I think people get that completely wrong. You learn how to manage it. Like when most people, like I will say like most people, I want to say normal, but like most people, like there's a spectrum, right? There's like a, there's a happy and there's a sad and people kind of float in the spectrum, right? They're a little happy, a little sad where some people will be like on one, on each end of the spectrum, right? You can drink a bit and, you know, or there's some who just get hammered all the mm -hmm. time, right? You can, you know, smoke or whatever, or there's those who just like over, overdo it. So when you like, when you get further into your mental health, you just learn how to manage it. Right. And it's just management. So like when it comes to like, I, I use, like I use some of that for like, I got to get through a set and I'll go back and like, and it won't make me, it won't trigger me. It's cool because I can use it as like, as fuel. Like I'll use something to kind of like light a spark or ignition of like, of rage. And then it's a controlled rage. Cause I was taught how to be, how to, how to have control rage during football or fighting. Mm -hmm. It's like, it, that's a pilot things controlled rage. It's like, you, there's no way you're thinking about roses and, yeah, and hugging yeah. when you got a bar off over your, you know, on, on your shoulders or picking up, you know, a bar. So there's like, there's a place that I can go that I have complete control over. And uh, yeah, so it's, yeah. So how did the discipline develop then? Because if you have this time where you're partying all the time, you're focused and then party and then not. Yeah. And then, then you end up in bodybuilding, you know, which is the most disciplined freaking thing that you can <laughs> yeah, do. Yeah. That's a big change. Yeah. You know, from the mindset of that party and football to this, to where every minute is basically calculated yeah. throughout the day. 
Yeah. It, you know, it's, um, that's a good question. I, I honestly, like I've thought of it before and I think it's just because bodybuilding was just another addiction for me. Right. And it was a good addiction. Right. Like, and there's, there's parts of bodybuilding that aren't like the best, but when it came to like, like I get fully submerged in stuff. Like I get like, you know, I started archery and I had to get everything I needed for archery, like everything, you know, I'm riding, you know, I'm, I'm, I did a track course like uh, last year, two years ago and I'm racing. I got everything I need to get for like, I will get at all the things. It's like when it came to bodybuilding, what do I need to be, be, to be, to be the best at this thing or to be as good as I can at this. So when it came like, you know, the discipline part of it, it was, I had one part under control, like just at the start of it. So I was like, you know, managing addictions and, you know, partying. So I knew that I couldn't party for like bodybuilding. Like, I, I passed, I mean, I, and I don't, I, I shouldn't say I regret it, but there's some things I wish I didn't do. Like I was, I didn't go to weddings. I didn't go to birthdays. I, you know, I missed out on a lot of things because bodybuilding was the thing. Like I am, I need to do this. I have prep. I can't do anything. I'm not doing anything. I think I started actually doing something with the year I won my pro card. I was like, just let loose, just have fun. Like not like it's destructive, but mm-hmm. you know, like enjoy the process. If someone's got a, a birthday, go to it. You know what I mean? Like if someone invites you, like I was, I played piano, so I was, I was playing at my buddy's wedding, you know, I missed it because I got nationals, you know what I mean? So I just get fully submerged in things. And I know that the, I, I know that's what's required. And for me, it's always a, it's always a journey of what's necessary. Not like what's, what's, what's the minimum you need to do, but like, what is the absolute maximum necessary need for a certain thing? Like, what do I, like I always say when it comes to training, like it's, it's a balance of like, you know, your tightrope walking, you know, a load that's going to stay on the muscle, but away from trauma, like trauma mm-hmm. to the joint. But it's not to just, you know, have a weight that you can use and perform really well. Like, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to take that weight and control it as much as it can, teetering on the side of, you know, but I know how to control and not go over there. So it's the same thing when it came to like, you know, the bodybuilding, this is what's necessary. Like this lifestyle, you know, this kind of monk lifestyle is necessary. Now it evolved because I, when I, the more educated I got and the more I dove into certain things in terms of like dieting, nutrition and, and, uh, you know, training, it was like, as long as you control, you, you know, you control the balance of everything, you're going to have a better outcome. Right. So that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of how I, you know, stayed consistent, but I couldn't do bodybuilding. And before that, not a chance. Yeah. It was just a timing thing. Like I just, yeah. So when you started throwing out the mental health stuff, the, what's going to happen from that, you're going to throw it out. Then there's going to be an influx of people asking you questions. Yeah. So what are the most popular or what are the popular questions that people will come to you with? Um, what's your biggest challenge? And I tell them like, my challenge is always, is, is bait. Like for me, it's a, a present thing. Uh, um, it's, it's being in the moment. Right. So a lot of times, like when most, I will say most mental health illnesses, have a you know core of the person not being present they're always triggered by something shamed by something in the past or you know some an event that happened or they're worrying about something that they're putting in their their mind that's going to happen in the future and they're you know the worry about so for me it's like it's like being present they're always asking me like what do you do to be present i'm like i'll i'll I do like opposite action thinking you know like basically doing the opposite of what your body wants to do when it comes to you know, anxiety, like if your heart's racing really fast and, you know, you're, you're, you're wandering off somewhere, find, get a clock or with a second hand and then watch the clock or watch something tick. And that's going to bring you back, you know, f- you know, uh, focus on your breathing, you know, like start feeling stuff, mm-hmm. like touch things that are here in the moment. So you can bring yourself back to where you are. So I get a lot of that thing. A lot of those questions of like, how do you stay present? Um, that's one of the biggest ones to be honest. Like I think more about that, but that's like the biggest one. Cause I'm very, vocal about what mental illness I have. And when people ask me that, that is like one of the main ones, one of the main components of BPD is like being present. So how do you work with that being present, but yet you have to do things to, to build for your future? Exactly. That's, yeah. It's so like, it's, um, I had, I, I had a session on Monday and I was literally like, my therapist was like, so how are things? And I'm like, I'm still thinking that I'm going to implode sometime because I'm very surprised of how I'm dealing with a lot of what's going on in my life right now. Um, because like you have to plan and it's like, it's good to plan and you have to plan, but like, 
like if I make a plan to put on 10 pounds in a year, mm -hmm. right? I can't put on those 10 pounds before I do what I have to do right now for those 10 pounds. Yeah. So my focus is always going to be let's plan, but then we have to take care of what happened right now in the present for the future thing to actually happen. So I have to, a lot of the time, like not get so in, in, like submerged in like the plan. Like the plan is I want my business to grow. Yeah. I yeah. want to do X, Y, and Z. For me to grow it, I have to do these things right now. There's steps to these things. I can't reach 10 pounds before I get one pound. So for me, it's like, it's always know what the, know what the plan is, but then focus on what we're doing right now. I went through a, I was last, last week at two weeks, no, last, two weeks ago, I was in um, Tulum at Zamna Music Festival. And it's a, you know, loud ass music, absolutely, utterly loud. Like at one point I remember walking by and my ears were hurting. I can hear the music, the vibration is making my body shake. It's loud, but it wasn't as loud as my thoughts. And I was like, holy, and at that time I was going through, you know, regular normal thing with work and whatnot. And I'm like, be here, be, be here, be now. And I would say those things like that to myself and I would close my eyes and I would, I would just think about, you know, I, I'd listen to an instrument and then I listen to the melody and, and it would bring me back to the present time. And then I was sitting there like, your body can't be anywhere but where it's at right now. Like you can't, it's impossible for you to be a second further than you are right now. So your thoughts can be everywhere. And the fact that my thoughts were everywhere and louder than the music that I was playing, it made me really understand when I was able to bring myself back to the present was you can't sit, you can't think, or you can't, you know, d dive into things that are in the future, worrying, like worrying about something gonna happen. Like, you know, your highs and lows of business, you're going to have highs and lows of business, but you're not going to sit there and worry about the, the, the high or the low it's happening. So you have to like take care of what's happening right now. So for me, it was always, if you're planning something, it's, know what the know what the goal is but there's steps to for that goal to happen i cannot get to that goal if i don't take care of yeah. step one first yeah. yeah with that and business will be an example you know there's there's stuff you have to do yeah right yeah. and if you're always consumed of what well, i can't do that because that didn't work before yeah right or i have to do this because this is what where i want to go but then if you're never actually doing it yeah which yeah. seems to be the case yes. a lot yeah. is the actual real important things yeah. don't get done. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you know, one of the things I've implemented so long ago, I can't remember is, you know, there's three things every day that have to be done. Yeah. It just, they're non-negotiable. They yeah. have to be done. Yeah. Then there's all that stupid shit you have to take care of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. kind of comes in yeah. through there. But if those three things aren't done, then you're, you're you're not in the present as you're saying yeah. which means your future is going to be compromised 100 yeah, percent because of that yeah. so it, it's a rabbit hole yeah because yeah. if you don't then you're freaking out because your future is going to be compromised but you're not doing anything to make it not compromised yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> so the music example is a really good example to be able to drive that home though because yeah. your thoughts you know will cloud yeah you know all that so you can dial those back yes yeah you know, and sometimes I think that's in a weird way, more obvious than what it really yeah. is. Yeah, you know, like yeah. people use cold plunges and all this other stuff just yeah. to do the same thing that we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they'll jump in there. Oh shit. They're shocked. And yeah. then it brings them back. It's <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. you could have done that yeah. without freezing your balls off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And probably faster and sooner. Yeah, exactly. But <clears throat> the, the trick is <clears throat> it's easy to go back out of the music, for instance, yeah. like you can get back into that moment, but then three minutes later, there it is again. Yeah. yeah. And then it's this repeating cycle. Yeah. So how do you deal with that repeating cycle? So I, I literally, it's a, it's a, a mindset for me. And it's, that's how I came up with like progress. I won mm -hmm. when I was like progressive overload your life, like type thing. And it's, I knew that, you know, through the, at the beginning of this entire, you know, of my journey in the mental health, you know, learning, proper coping, you know, better positive coping mechanisms and being present. I knew that right off the bat that in having a good, you know, therapist that like, I'm not going to just, this is going to be an overnight thing. This is going to be a practice thing. So I'm like, I know I'm going to, I'm going to win some battles and lose some battles. I'm going to win the first one. I might, I might win one and lose nine. 
but eventually I'm going to win two. I'm going to win three. I'm going to win four. So for me, in my head, it was like every time these things happen, it's an opportunity for me to practice these things. So a lot of the time, a lot of things I've used is like, is a lot of like, you know, um, self talk. Like, how are you talking to yourself? Like, how are you like changing the, your, your dialogue, right? Instead of saying, like, you know, I can't do something, you know, or, or, or whatever, it's like, I'm, you know, I'm unable now, but I'm working on it mm-hmm. type thing. So for me, it was like when it comes to, you know, anytime something that happens, it's practice for me. So like I like I had this great conversation with Antoine and it was like bodybuilders are professional bodybuilders are pros at doing reps. We're really good at repping things out. I just that's all we do. Rep mm-hmm. after rep, day after day was doing rep, rep, rep. So for, so it, it was easy for me to conceptualize that thing. And be like, every time that you have something happen, like this is an opportunity for you to practice. And so like, even when I left the festival, literally at the, at the festival, there was, um, the, it was the entire festival. It wasn't like I was, I said at one time, I was like, ah, I'm good to go. Yeah. It was like, great. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm like, great. Awesome. And all of a sudden, I'm like, why are you thinking about that again? I'm like, well, give me a second, give me a second to bring myself back again. So, and it was, you know, something I was very conscious of too, when I was there, I was like, I am using this time to practice being in the moment. Especially because like you're always gonna go through like you're gonna go through things in life for sure, but they're they're always newer ones. There's a newer circumstance you're gonna go through that you haven't went through before that you have to practice again. It's like reaching a PR. That's why it was the progressive overload your life thing. It's like, yeah, you'll you learn how to manage this. The next thing that happens, you have to go through the same process. Like gym wise, we're consciously adding more weight to get stronger. When in, in life life, it's almost like, you know, the, the, it's like the saying, you know, the, the life's the toughest teacher gets a test before a lesson. You don't get a, you don't get a warm up mm-hmm. rep to be able to, you know, I've, I've been practicing this for, I've been doing these reps for so long. Now I'm in my last mezzo and now I'm going to do my PR. It's like, no, nah, nah, they're like, here's more weight that you've never had before. And all you have to do is, all you can do is like take what you've known and apply that again to this new situation. So it's like, again, it's like, it's always going to be like practicing. If you get in your head to, look at those things as opportunities and not setbacks so i'm always like and i I know like i know it's an obvious thing it's challenging for people to be like yeah take that and look at it as a positive thing is happening that's why i was like saying like you know bad things happen for a good reason it's your opportunity to get stronger and when you go through something mentally you go through a mental breakthrough or like i said it before like you if you've been through something you've made it through you've you've went through a situation that you've been able to pull yourself out of you got stronger so like whenever you're going through something again, draw from a place that you had to be strong from and do the same thing again. And it's just practicing getting better and better and better or getting stronger at it. When, after you became conscious of your self-talk, did it become interesting listening to other people speak? Yeah. Because when you listen to other people speak, they'll say things, yeah. you know, sometimes it's like, ooh. You know, it's yeah, and like it's, it's like a slap in your own face. Like they shouldn't have just said that. Yeah, yeah. It's honest for like you know, you're a coach. You know, you 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 have it's there. You're a therapist too, right? So you hear, especially in in our space, it's um like tra- like training is more than like training. Whether it's powerlifting, whether it's hypertrophy, whatever. There's it's more than just lifting. It's a very like individual spiritual thing it's it's a journey of like self like you know self-awareness especially when you're going through like you know you go through a rep i don't care if you're if you're lifting a pr or you're just you know doing a drop set of some sort you're gonna go through a something in your head is gonna go through like doubt yeah you know discomfort you know stop doing this like your body's gonna send off natural cues to be like hey there's pain here stop you know, there's always those, there's, you know, that conversation in your head, that dialogue is like, hey, this is hard. Let's stop right now. We can, we can stop now. We've done enough. Or like, hey, stop. This is too much. Or, hey, this is too scary. And in your head, you have to deal with all those things. So when it comes to like the self-talk, it's like in our space, it's, I know that when I'm coaching anybody that they're going to go through something that's very personal. Like most of the time people are are going through any kind of like, you know, progression, whether it's trying to lose weight or put on muscle or whatever. It's actually an, it's a, it's a personal thing that they haven't really maybe won or down. And you can see and hear it in how they talk with themselves. You know, like I ask questions like, what made you want to do this? I really want to just be comfortable in my skin. Okay. So 
how are you talking about yourself in the first place? Like, if you're not comfortable in your skin, wh what's that conversation? Like I always say it before, like that was my, in my head, my dialogue was always the angry hockey dad, right? Like why, why is there an angry hockey dad yelling at you in your head? Like, why does that have to be that person? You know, who's like, what's that dialogue in your head and saying? And the self-talk is the thing that's the most limiting that people have. And I see with like bodybuilders, for sure. It's like, you know, you just lost five pounds, look amazing. Yeah, but I feel watery. It's like, just, what do you, like, you get abs, you can see them. You, mm -hmm. you look great. I know, but you know, I, I feel like a little bloated. Like, is that bloating that water making you say a lot of things? That you're, what's, what's that conversation going on in your head? So yeah. it's like, my thing is like trying to get people to immediately change the way they're talking. And I'll, I'll bring that up to them. I'll stop them and they're dead in their tracks. If they say something like, you know, negative about themselves, like, oh, we're not gonna use that word. We're gonna use this instead. And um, I think that's one of the biggest advocates to people progressing in their own life is just like changing how they say things about themselves. Well, with the, the water type of thing, if they say that enough, they'll probably start holding water because yes, of the cortisol yeah, they're going to produce. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which is when, when you're peaking for a show, that's got to be a mental game right there. <laughs> yeah. Because you got to be chill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How's that work? Yeah, yeah. When you're on deathbed during that whole period yeah, of time. Yeah. But you need to be chill because if you're not, you're going to have a film of water. Yeah. Like, yeah. What the hell? Yeah. You know, so you have to become a master of that. Yeah. At some point. Yeah. And I, I think that's the reason why you'll see, you'll see some bodybuilders, they're great, you know, shit from night show to in Olympia, you see this all the time. It's like, yeah. what the hell happened? Yeah. You know, I wonder how much of that's just this mental game. Yeah. It's lost. You know, yeah. It, there's other factors, but, For sure. know, but that's gotta be a big part of that. Yeah. We were, I was talking to, who was I talking about, about that? Um, yeah. I was talking to Nick and, uh, and a uh, guy about that and, and like, you know, what is the cause? Like, why do you guys, you know, what was their, um, you know, theory of why we see these big changes? And I'm like, well, first of all, I'm like, and we, it's a stress thing. Like your body's already in a place of stress. Like it's not supposed to be 5% body fat holding <laughs> muscle, number one. So your body's trying to do everything in the world not to be there. And we're doing everything in the book to stop it from not wanting to be there. Mm -hmm. So there's already stress from, training stress from cardio stress from am i gonna peak in time am i you know what's the what's going on today like you know stress of the environment and then if you start adding on conscious stress it just you're just exacerbating it mm -hmm. and especially when you're at a lower body fat percentage and you know you can visually see this guy's really dry and all of a sudden now he's not dry anymore it's like yeah because your body's really sensitive so if you add on all those factors and then you add on consciously stressing yourself about a certain thing. It's just everything on everything just falls apart at that point. So I think a lot of the issue when it comes to people like guys changing so like drastically is like, you know, yeah, there's all the obviously obvious factors yeah. of, you know, physiological factors that are happening. But then there's also the, the mental side of it, the cautious, the, con the conscious side that your body will do exactly what you tell it to do. Your body only knows how to do one thing and say yes. Right, it's not going to say no. If you say, "Yeah, I'm fat," it's going to be like, "Yes," right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, it'll, like when people pass away, they pass away when they're like, you know, a lot of time, unless they're, it's, you know, tragic. Well, most of the time, it's when they're ready to go. Like, it's like I don't want to deal with this anymore. Mm -hmm. My like, uncle passed away just a few weeks ago, and um, he was sent home, and, you know, it came to the point where it was like, "I'm good, I'm done," but they held on for this long. Right. So it, it's, it's the people don't really realize how much that's why I always stress about like, cause I see the benefits of, of like having stronger, you know, more stable mental health. I see that the, the, I would not be able to do what I'm doing right now if I didn't have my mental health in check. That mm -hmm. is a, a guarantee. All of the things that, that are, that are spoken about or written about BPD, people deal with it. I would not be able to do any of this like at all own a business not a chance have a daughter and that dynamic not a chance you know uh like all these things so it's like that's why i'm so like you know adamant about being open about it because i'm seeing the direct benefits of it and i'm like even if you're completely fine your brain's great i think you should just and like just understanding who you are consciously is this going to be like we don't really realize how programmed we are like i have you have kids mm -hmm. yeah of course yeah um i'm I, I can 
you can see like, and I say, I, I look up Gen X all the time because I love, you know, kind of seeing what my kid's able to do. But it's like you, I know that my kid's already programmed a bit, right? And I do my best to not program her. Like, to, like I do my absolute best. I haven't even brought up like religion at all to her. Like I'm not even, I had religion in my head before, like at her age. And I'm like thinking to myself, I'm like, what? Like t- trying to figure out the voice of God, yeah. the devil, and your own voice when you're like, when you're four is like, <laughs> of course, you're know, like, what the heck? So I know there's a conscious program, but like, but we're so already like there's some there's some like studies done like you know when it comes to psychology we are we are already de- completely fully developed at 18 mentally and our and all the ways that we act and perceive things the only difference is when you get older just new experiences and how you deal with those you know and that'll kind of base maturity on how you can deal with new situations or how uh, how you can you know avoid making the same mistakes but you're kind of like the same person you are right but at the same time if you don't know that you're doing the exact same things that your parents were doing before, and even if you have these, the, the healthiest of minds, you're still going to react to your environment based on how you have been programmed. Mm-hmm. So if you don't, you know, take some time to, you know, go on the journey of like some conscience, it's like, why do you, you know, there's everyone has, does a certain thing they do all the time for some reason. There's everyone on this planet is probably doing the same thing and wondering like, why did I do this again type thing? And it's like, you're programmed. And until you're conscious of that, you're going to continue to do that thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Just some people can deal with that for the rest of their lives and not have it, you know, affect them that bad. And some people, it affects them very negatively, right? So it's, uh, that's why I'm like very open about mental health. It's like, I know the power of what it can do for your life, um, just in order to just control. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'll, seg- I'll, I'll segue that into the nutrition and dieting because the mental health becomes an issue yeah. there. So I guess the question we'll start with is, what was your inspiration for writing the final diet? My mental, like mental the book. health. Yeah, the, yeah. Well, the book. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It was. So your mental health was the inspiration. Yeah, yeah. It's because like, like food, like it's funny because I, I learned a lot. Like it was, uh, that book was supposed to be written a while ago. Um, and it just came out this year. When I finished doing, when I stopped, doing gear um i i like especially during this this prep i was like very like why am i you know like i was like i was like i feel like this is not as hard as it should be and i was like ah obviously it's like my mental health is better i'm not you know using anything that's affecting Mm -hmm. hormonally my brain how it thinks and whatnot so like a lot of the issues that came to like with my mental health i dealt with bulimia and then just my mental health in general Food and, and my and my partner, she's a you know um, registered dietitian. She's doing her master's in, in psychology counseling right now, and um, I knew the effects of of nutrition on our body, especially as a bodybuilder. It's like number one, we're losing fat, and fat's one of the biggest you know you know our biggest advocates in terms of like hormones and cognitive health and whatnot. We're consciously losing fat, then we're constantly taking things to lower estrogen. All the other all the hormones that are are keeping us at bay like oh you got diet brain it's like diet brain is a lack of of like fuel to your brain and most of that is like you know proper you know fuel you know fats protein carbohydrates and whatnot and a lot of the problems that people have when it comes to their mental health is like you can mitigate a lot of the issues by just having proper nutrition right your brain is like people don't realize how much i forget exactly the number but your brain needs a lot of fuel and you have people who are dieting, you know, I've, you know, guys who are like 300 pounds who are eating 2000 calories. And I'm like, so you want yourself to lose weight, put on muscle somehow, do normal ass activities that aren't even gym regulated and still give your body the fuel it needs to do what it needs to do first. Cause your body's going to do what it needs to do first. It's going to prioritize the, the important things I say, it's going to prioritize your brain, your digestion. It's not going to be like, I'm going to give you some biceps over your brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like that, that alone is like, you know, it affects people. If you're already feeling yourself, if you're, not, if you're already running on empty, how do you expect to, you know, your, your biggest advocate is food and your mental health. Like bodybuilders are the absolute, we're nut jobs at the end of prep. And that's some, like for me consciously, I knew like during prep, like, 
happy I had a therapist. Because if I didn't have a therapist, I would not be conscious or aware of of the certain things that I was doing. Like just like in terms of like where my brain was at. So when it came to like writing that book, it was a place where it was like, I need people to learn the most apps, like just any Joe should be able to pick this thing up and take some from it and learn from it. Yeah. And what are the biggest takeaways that you have from that? Or what are the biggest takeaways from that book? The biggest takeaways, yeah. just balance. About like, like understanding like, you know, what, like understanding what like calories actually are. You know, that's the biggest thing is like teaching somebody what energy, like how to like fuel your body properly, number one. Two, it's like understanding that, you know, it's not just calories in, calories out. I think that's like, uh, I think it's selling everybody short when it's just like, yeah, it's calories and calories. It's like, it's not just that. It's, it's having a balance of everything and understanding what each of those macronutrients do for your body. So like, I'm always, I don't care what diet you're doing, but you should always make sure that you're fueling yourself with all the macronutrients. If you're a vegetarian, get all your macronutrients in. If you're carnivore or whatever, adjust it. So whatever you're doing, make sure you're getting, you're not selling yourself short of all the macronutrients because they have specific jobs to do, you know, and just that alone, I think gives people a lot more insight of like, you know, cause I get that question all the time. And the biggest problem I have with, the, with athletes or clients, they come in is like, they're too scared to eat more food because they did calories in calories out. And they're, they, they've lost all this weight and they can't lose any more weight and they don't know which way to go now. And they're like, I don't know what to do. It's like, well, here's how the body actually works. Like here's what the, here's how the body works in the most simplistic terms. Your body is going to prioritize everything it needs first. Your BMR or your RMR is going to prioritize that. You need to give your body at least that and then some for you to be able to, you know, run properly. And that's like, I would say that one of the biggest takeaways from that is you know, just the non-negotiables of like building muscle, you know, um, and fueling your body, make sure you eat enough calories, enough protein, um, drink enough water, get enough rest. You know, those are like non-negotiables. If you want to like build muscle or sustain muscle, you can do those things. If you don't do those things, then your goals are, are arbitrary. They're not. The, the section that I really liked was where you broke down each or the popular diets like keto, yeah, carnivore, yeah. vegan, and so yeah. forth. And you listed the pros and cons, yeah. which <clears throat> they are what they are. Yeah. But if people know what the cons are, yeah. then they can mitigate those cons yeah. Yeah. with that. And I think in a lot of cases, they, they don't, yeah. right? They just stick to whatever that is. Yeah. And then over a period of time, it's, they don't stay with it. Yeah. And it, it creates deficiencies. Yeah, And that's what I, I want to do with the book was to like, sh like, a lot of that is there are a lot of those stories are from my own experience and clients. And when it was like those, um, you know, writing that book, there are the ideas, you know, I had a consultant that had some, and some help in terms of like ideas, but it was one of the biggest things was, was like, don't have this book, don't write this book, Johnny, where it's just like information where you can, anyone can just go online and be like, Hey, what's the vegetarian yeah. diet? Like, like, have you tried, I've tried a lot of the diets. So I want people to know like, okay, so here's the, here's the good and the bad. You're like here, hey, you want a crash diet? It is how it works. Here's a bad part about crash yeah. dieting. You want to bulk? Hey, it works, but here's the bad part about, you know, here's, so like it gives you, it takes you out of the garden of Eden type thing. You know what I mean? Where it's like, don't do this. Why? Well, it's going to make you do it. Like it's human nature. If you tell someone not to do something, they're going to be like, well, I don't know why I can't mm -hmm. do it. Right. Or, but like, here's, 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 that, here's what happens if you do, do, do that thing. Right. Here's what happens if you do a vegetarian diet. Here's what to look out for. You know, here are the things you need to do. Here's the things if you're going to try to bulk or try to cut, you know, all the things that are there. I want you to know there is the side, the two sides of it. So you can make your own decision in the end. Yeah. The bulking is a, it's an interesting one there because the assumption is, you know, as long as you're in a calorie surplus, you're probably going to cover all your micronutrient yeah. needs. Yeah. Right. But that's not always true no, yeah. because the, m most of what they're eating is all shit, you know, so the yeah. base isn't in there. And do you see that throughout the bodybuilders that come to you beforehand? So if they're coming to you for a bulk and you look at what their diet is, it's, yeah. it's trash yeah, you know, yeah, to yeah. where maybe 50%, not even 50, 30% yeah. might be good. Yeah. But yeah. then the 70% is just trash. Yeah. It's, it's, that's usually what, that's usually what it is. Um, 
And that's something that I learned. It was like, and that's the hardest. I always, when people come in, I'm always telling them like, like, let's number one, we're not, we're not bulking. Okay. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to be in a slight surplus and add muscle. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to do. We're not going to use the word bulking, right? If you want to use the word lane bulk, whatever. The word is the word regardless, but like it's, in, in, it's immediately like, we're going to not eat this way. Now at the same time, there's also balance, right? And this is something that I'm a huge advocate as you can eat junk. There's nothing wrong with junk. As long as your junk isn't 50% of your diet. Yeah. Right. Like, and that's, and that, I think it's, it's a big thing when it comes to dieting for me is I say even dieting, but nutrition, like my goal isn't to, all right, guys, chicken, broccoli, and rice. That's it forever. You can never have a snicker bar for the rest of your life. No more hog and dawes. It's, it's no, it's like, let's get yourself, let's get your, let's get your body to a place where you can have those things. And then when you can, you know, the amounts that are necessary, not necessarily, but like, you know, I like Oreos and Ben and Jerry's. I'll eat an entire thing of Oreos and Ben and Jerry's. But I won't have that thing every single day. It's not part of my diet. Yeah. You know, it's, it's something that like, hey, I got some calories. I want to, you know, I'm going to get some calories in me and I want to enjoy this. 80 to 85% of my diet is completely on point. The other 15% will be off, but my off isn't like also garbage either. It's like sushi is like something for me as like, you know, a fun thing. Um, the thing that gets dirty, I would say, I would say 5% of my diet is absolutely garbage. So when you have these clients, athletes come in, when you have these athletes come in and it's trash, how long does it take them before their digestive system is actually working the way it's supposed to? It's not that it's not that um, it's it's quick because they they uh, the question I uh, ask them ask every week is one of them is something I got from Matt Jensen actually because um, I was doing it for he I added some questions to it one of the questions is how's your digestion so on a week to week it's like how is your digestion and the results of that week like if their weight goes up or down it's uh, I would say to put it this way if you have a good if you have a bad week right or less optimal week whatever that answer is usually going to be my digestion wasn't that good. Okay, why well, wasn't it good? How was your adherence to the diet? Oh, no, I'm not that good. Mm. Okay, cool. So they're constantly answering these questions and then they're starting to see the correlation of my digestion was really good. And also my sleep was really good. And also this was really good. And then I lost weight and I was stronger, you know, and my adherence to the diet was, you know, so it's like, it, and it doesn't take long because when you're eating, I find it only takes like a couple of weeks really to feel your body to acclimate to or just like even feeling the, the, the changes digestion wise when it comes to you're eating garbage and also you're eating better food like you could even say when it comes to fiber like if you're eating not that much fiber if you're eating like a majority you know carbs all the time your carbs aren't from a fiber source and it's like all right so we're eating protein and carbs okay how's the fiber not to get okay because now we're eating more greens oh, i'm taking more bowel movements hmm, cool right like it's, my stomach isn't at you know it's it, it's, it get bloats for here and there, but it's because you're eating, you know, maybe some broccoli or asparagus or whatever, having those things, but like they're seeing the, the changes happen almost like within the first couple of weeks and then seeing the, the feeling of it. Like everyone knows bubble guts feels like crap. Like, yeah. like you know, I have the, you know, I have Oreos and Ben and Jerry's or whatever. And I'll, I promise you in the morning, like the first like couple of bowel movements aren't the best ones. Mm -hmm. It just goes right through me, but I know how I feel. And like, and, and I know that if I'm feeling that way, I know that you're definitely feeling a certain way if your majority of your diet is like this. And that's a lot of times when you have, when people have like, when they come to me, they're coming with like not that good in nutrition, your digestion is terrible. And then all of a sudden they're just, you know, their the inflammation is like through the roof. And they're wondering why like, oh, I don't feel that good. My energy's low. It's like, well, your, your gut health is gonna be a huge advocate of that. Well, so, a lot of people over a period of time of doing that just become acclimated to it. Yeah. And they just think that's how they're supposed to feel. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm getting older. You know, that would be <laughs> yeah, one of those yeah. things that fall into there. Yeah. yeah. Where with that change in there, then they realize they weren't really just getting, well, they are, but they're not really getting older, older. Yeah. In that yeah. sense. Yeah. It's their food's trash. Yeah. Yeah. Then they clean it up and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a huge difference as regular bowel movements have a sex drive. They can train. Yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. all these other things yeah. change yeah. that, you know, another group of people may try to give them pills. Yeah. You know, for each one of those yeah. things. Yeah. Which is something that we have to fight. Yes. You know, when you're in the fitness industry is is that. Yeah. You know, where it could just be as simple as not eating trash. Yeah. All yeah. the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. You wonder why your brain's fucked up. Yeah. 
yeah. when you're not feeling it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh that's been um I heard uh, there's a podcast, another one I was listening to, I think it was uh who had I want to call him out, but a lot of the, the uh, there's a lot of the the myth that if you eat something you can oh they have like, you know, you have to eat this thing is gonna make you look a certain way. And it's like it won't. Like you like you can yeah, you can have the difference that food makes in your body is how well your brain functions. So like you can definitely build muscle eating pop tarts and protein. For sure you can. But you're missing the other nutrients that are going to help fuel your brain. Right? So if you're not eating proper amounts of like, you know, omega or protein or all the, you know, if you're not if those if your diet is is void of those things, you're you can still build muscle. You can still look really good on stage. You can do things your macros, but you're not going to think properly. You're not going to you're not going to function the right way. So like the physiological changes aren't necessarily that when you're in the proper, like, again, like if you eat over too much, you're eating, you know, crap all day long. Yes, you are going to see physical changes of you getting fatter and unhealthy and whatnot. But if you're in a deficit and you're eating, and if you're doing like a Sam Selleck type thing, right? And that's like a big thing. He's eating what he wants. Of course he can. He can eat exactly anything he wants. He's, a, he's 21. Yeah. He's getting older. He's, he's on, of course. But What's going to affect him is his actual gut health and his cognitive, uh, you know, cognitive um, health. Those are things that, that are going to have the biggest, uh, you know, um, effects. Yes. Which in time he'll figure out. Of course. You know, because he's serious about what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it yeah, will, because yeah. eventually it will affect your ability to train. For sure. You yeah. know, the mind muscle that we were talking about yeah. or just the ability to to focus under really heavy weight. Yeah. You know, you have it's a different type of focus. Yeah. If it's a one rep max and stuff yeah. like that. It and that gets screwed up. Yeah. You know, over a period of time with that. Yeah. Or you can't there's the arousal curve. You can't control where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Either it's too high, too low, but you're not able to pivot. Yeah. yeah. You know, with that. I I see that a lot, you yeah. know, with top lifters is they if it's all trash, then sometimes being overly aroused is not good. Yeah. Right. Because then they end up doing stupid shit. They have to be able to, in seconds, be able to dial that back down yeah. to where it needs to be, but they can't. Yeah. Right. Because it's just stuck. Yeah. And I, the cleaner, their, the better their diet gets. I don't want to say clean, but the better their diet gets. Yeah. Balance. They're, they're able to be able to do that. Yeah. Totally. And it's, it's interesting how many times when you see that and then you probe into it. You know, like, what's your diet? You're like, oh, shit. The yeah. whole thing's trash? Yeah. It's not just yeah. like a day? Yeah. Like, this is like normal? Yeah. And it is. Yeah. And it might work up to a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but after that, shit, it has to change. Yeah. I guess the only debate with that would be, <clears throat> does it have to change when they're 20, 21? You know, in that range. Yeah. We would say it, it'd be a good habit to develop sooner. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I don't know how much difference it's going to make in that window. I and I think it's like I think it's one of those like you know PhD questions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, get a Hooman or a Lane or a Mike on this channel, to do it. So, but I I think it's I then to touch on Sam for a minute for a second. I think that he's I think he's I think he's going to switch over fairly quick. Mm -hmm. You know, we we're seeing like the last six months, right, of what he's doing. And he's around, like he's eventually, you know, he's gonna he's gonna click over. And when he does, like it's just that's gonna be lights out because he's already lights out. I think that in that time, when it comes like I have a section in the in the book, you know, when it comes to dieting, you shouldn't be worried about dieting when you're, I don't think, when you're a young adolescence to like, I don't know, like his age. Yeah. Like just eat. Like get like make sure you're fueling yourself at least. You know what I mean? Your body is still developing, your brain's still developing. Yeah, of course. You want to make sure that you're eating, you know, good omega rich foods and whatnot to help with that. But like, it's, I think, you know, I think at that time it's like, get the basics down. I think he has the basics down as people just get too stuck on like, wait a minute, when you ate that yeah. thing there, it's like, chill out. Man. Well, in that phase too, the motivation, that may not be the right word, but the motivation's at a whole nother level. Yeah. I mean, he really, really wants to go train yeah, every yeah. single yeah, day yeah. where you do it for 15 years. You still want to do it, yeah, yeah. but there's still a lot of those days yeah, where you're like, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of other <laughs> yeah. shit I'd really like to do, yeah. you know, and that's where I think the nutrition plays a big role there as yeah. well, because it, you have now you're kind of forcing, not forcing, yeah. but you're making yourself do something yeah. that 
you're not as excited to do yeah. that you were 15 years ago. And I, I, and for me, like nutrition for me is a, um, it's a, it's a habit thing. It's a, it's a, it's behavioral changes. So like, you, like even with like my approach with, with clients, athletes, it's, I don't, when I complete their plan for them, they have the plan, the training, I'm very training focused. And I'm, and I'm secondary nutrition, not in terms of like we're putting the back burner, but it's, we're going to, we're going to figure out a behavioral change for your diet, for your nutrition first. And then we're like, so here's what I'm getting at. When you're in the gym and you're learning how to do a movement, you're going to do a hundred reps in a day, probably easily. Right. That's, that's more reps. You're getting to learn a move. You're learning something that learning that neurological pathway is being processed. like in time a lot more than prepping a meal right prepping a meal or doing meal prep is like a once or twice a week thing maybe if you're doing it you know in, in big amounts whatever or it's just like a individual thing if you have like four meals you're, you're not doing it as often so if you're we don't care how old you are but like all of a sudden like i want to turn my nutrition around and like all right give me the meal plan i'm gonna follow this thing right away it's like good luck you're not gonna it's not gonna happen mm -hmm. right my thing is like let's let's work on training optimizing that and it's like i'm dead serious like it's it's crazy like it's a as i'll tell people like you know they'll get their meal plan and you know i can't eat all this food i haven't eaten so much food before this is someone who's overweight is eating less food i'm like don't try to eat all of it right away eat what you can right now eat the stuff that you can eat while training you start to acclimate into training i can promise you, you're probably gonna get hungrier and it literally it could see the change happen their training optimizes all of a sudden they're like they can actually eat that other meal they eat another meal, they're trained, they're more efficient, also now they're losing weight. So it's like, it's, it's like, tr it's changing, it's treating the, you know, when it comes to Sam or something like that, it's like, let him change when he's going to change. Because when it happens, it's going to, it's going to be a longer thing than being like, stop doing all of this right now. It's like, no, like if he's, right now he's doing everything he needs to do. He's, he understands how much he should be eating. He's looking at portions. Portion control is the biggest thing when it comes to anybody in their nutrition. Mm -hmm. Like understand what a portion looks like learn a behavioral change that you can stick with. You're missing meal one. Okay, let's just work on eating meal one. Why are you missing meal one? Well, I'm always ready to work and blah, blah, blah. Okay, what are we eating for meal one? Let's find something that's more, that's easier to make that you can start these learning, these, these you know, habit changes, behavioral changes that you're starting to rep out making meal one. And then now you have meal one done all the time. You're always eating meal one. I just with like a few clients are like, you know, they're eating, they're having their shake that's full of, you know, everything they need. They're drinking while they're working. Finally, we have you eating that one meal. Yeah. Now you're not super hungry in the night and, and binging, right? You're, I'm not drinking water. How do we start drinking more water, right? So it's like those little things I think that people need to understand. It's, you, I always say like, we're changing your, your, you're trying to make your, your fitness journey fit into your life, not your life to your fitness journey. Because that's just not going to happen. You're not going to just to make one any change on habit. Mm -hmm. Like stop biting your nails. You might do it for a week and all of a sudden you're not even thinking you're biting your nails and you're like, oh, Pete's sake, I'm done. Now I can't stop biting my nails, just keep biting my nails. And it, it's the same thing, habit to habit. So trying to create behavioral changes and creating habits one at a time in nutrition is going to complement your training because they're going to they're gonna eventually catch up because you'll see the training happen almost like within the first month. If you get somebody to learn a movement pattern and they're doing these things over and over and over and over again, they're seeing the results all of a sudden like, hey, I'm starting to feel better and I want to start really seeing this thing now. Let's work, let's make, let's be a little more, you know, honest with my diet now. And I got videos of guys who are like, they're training their, their deadlift or their, I one guy, Jack, his, his deadlift, his RDL is just atrocious. Just like rounded back, look, at, look like a cat bending over. And I, I, I showed new people, I'm like, watch this, first, first week eighth week it's perfect his squat he's 300 pounds and his squat is like ass to grass bar pathway is absolutely amazing he's moving he's like i watched him do a dip he's got the bands on he take his he take he gets out of the dip he just moves his foot like he just plops his foot out of yeah. it he's more mobile he's moving now he's like man i want this i want to see this stuff now because i'm seeing bits of, i'm seeing glimpses of it of it through this, this extra you know fat on my body now I really, really want to see it. So you're having this reward system through like them rewarding themselves, not rewarding, but like you're getting this great reward system of like achieving training, 
And now they want to see this, like they know like, oh, now I have this nice car. I can't keep putting unleaded in it. Yeah. I, want, I need to put diesel in this car. I'm going to deal with, you know, I'm going to put, you know, mm-hmm. Supreme in it. I can't put Supreme in my rental Benz, right? I can, I can put unleaded in it, but I'll probably burn out of that gas really quick and I'll end up being in Ohio for the next couple of days. But you know what I mean? So, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. When did you start your YouTube? Was it 2010, 2011? 20, 20, my fitness one was 2012. I had a two, uh, 2008. <laughs> it was really dumb. It was, it was me and a buddy uh, with bags on heads dancing. It was during I didn't find that one. <laughs> There's one guy, I think it was Johnny Zoom or something like that. I used to I used to as Johnny Zoom 36 or whatever. It was there during um it was right before a training camp and we had some recruits in and we had we put bags on the head and we we're doing a, a it was called the bag dance. It was actually a pretty uh popular, you know, mm-hmm. a popular little thing we did back in, in the university. And then I had my next one, it was like right after that. Um it was for my highlight tape for football, for the CF highlight tape. And then I started my channel in 2012. What was the motivation for starting the channel? I wanted to show people that you can blow your life and you can, and then you can come back from that. Mm-hmm. I want to put my, I want to put my journey to success on display. I want people to see like, so I want to see someone like, I want to showcase you can struggle through something, but you can make it. So what was the process then of building the channel? You know, because it it starts out and you have no it, subscribers. No so I, <laughs> I had, so like I was watching. You know, YouTube was a thing, and I was watching. You know, by that time, Coleman and and you know, Lou Flex and Flex Wheeler, all these guys had their stuff on YouTube. So I was like, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do all my. I'm gonna film all my preps. You know, take it through the journey. But I didn't have a computer, <laughs> so I yeah, that like then. Like this entire time, up until 2015, um, I was in the negatives, ten thousand dollars in the negatives. While I was in school, I was, I was when I was like housed with certain people who had money. I would, you know, when they throw their freezer burnt stuff out, I wait till they're gone, go into the garbage, boil it really quick, cook it, and then like have it as my own food. Mm-hmm. Like I was like hiding that I was like I was very very poor. Uh, my own fault. So when I started my YouTube channel, um, my first big payday, it was uh, my first prep. I, I got a, um, I was already coaching. Um, I was coaching athletes and whatnot. And then I got uh, hired by a doctor and um, he paid me $2,000 um, for the entire year. And I was like, what? I was like, holy shit, 2000 bucks. And I went over and bought myself a MacBook Pro. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and that was, I think it was like 1500 bucks. I had 500 bucks left from that. And then um, I was coaching a kid. Um, I was coaching a bunch of kids for football. And one of the dads was like a huge tech nerd. And he had this really cool, um, like, zip drive slash uh, camera. You got a flip camera? It was, it, was a dri- it was a camera that you can press and the, and the USB thing came out. Yeah. And you can click it in. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he's like, here, have this. Because he, he, he liked how I filmed this kid. Because I would take my computer. Oh, and I, I'd be like oh this, my God. trying to film the kid, whatever, right? <laughs> and I put it down and angle it and this and that. And he's like, "Hey, use this." So that was my first thing I had with my most of my videos in the beginning were just me flipping my my computer up. And then I worked at um, I worked at a Good Life, and uh, the Lost and Found was like, "You can you can have what's in the Lost and Found if it went for more than like ninety days." And there was this camera that was there that was there for like a month, and then I was like, "Huh." And then I kind of like pushed it a little further down inside the junk. <laughs> and then 90, whatever, man, 90 days came. And then uh, I had this, I got this camera and then that was the, the cool pics camera I had. And then I, that was it. Like I started that channel and I learned how to use, um, I found that, uh, I found like a year into my computer that there was an iMovie on my computer. I'm like, oh, there's, I can actually edit on this thing. And then the, my, the first year at the Olympia, I drove, I drove, um, my mom helped me buy a car, um, a lemon and I drove it to, I drove it to Windsor from Halifax to go to my first Olympia. So my sponsor's like, you know, we'll pay for your room, whatever, but you gotta make it there. Great sponsor. <laughs> so I, I drove to Windsor. Um, I played, um, I was hired to play for, uh, for our, uh, our, uh, one of the people at our school. Uh, who ran the head of counseling, whatever. What is counseling? Sorry, it was the, uh, whatever. It was the, the restaurant, whatever. He's getting married. He hired me to play for his wedding. He paid me 300 bucks um, to play. 
So I got a ticket from Detroit to uh, there and back. That's a, that's why I love coming here and, and flying out of Detroit because it's cheaper. So it was 300 bucks to go there and back anyway. So I flew there and back, went to Olympia, flew back to Detroit, took my car, drove it back, met Antoine at his place. And Antoine showed me how to, how to, how to edit um, better. So I was like, okay, this is how you edit. So I learned how to cut things, whatever. So it was a slow, it was, I was doing like, that's why I, that's why I really like Sam Seller. Cause he was doing what I was doing mm -hmm. from like, he was like, what he's doing now is that I was a one man show. I was just putting a camera up. I was filming it. I didn't have like, I, and I had to like slowly like integrate or like, you know, evolve from like, you know, I had a cool pics camera and then, and then I was coaching a, a photographer who, you know, was like, Hey, you want to just, you know, I want to trade my camera. It was like this, uh, it was a, a Canon 60D EOS, like monster thing. I'm like, yeah, for sure. So I, you know, I ended up using that camera. And then, um, at the time my, my partner, she hurt, she's small and her hands, you know, I got her to film and, and it was like her little hands on this big camera. So I had to like, you know, I traded that thing in for a smaller camera. So I literally like, I, I, and while I, as the money came in, I would slowly buy. So I would, I would buy things, the worst thing first. And then when I had more money, I would upgrade that thing. And then I would upgrade and keep upgrading and keep upgrading. So it was a long process of like, I didn't have anyone to put me on or have any, I didn't have uh, you know, I didn't have the money to, to rent any gear or even know I was, I learned everything on my own. A buddy of mine, he's a, um, a videographer in, in LA. He's a, you know, he taught me how to, you know, properly, you know, keep the subject and I'd hold the, I have a camera freaking moving like this half the time. And he like, keep the subject in the middle of rule of thirds. I'm like, cool, study these things. All right, cool. So, it's, so again, me diving into videography, like I know everything. I love cameras. I love film. I'm in film. So a lot of things like I gravitate to. So it was a very long process of like, I was putting a lot of work to get zero views. Let's put it that way. I, got, well, I think that's the thing a lot of people forget. Yeah. You know, and they'll see Sam and think that they can just jump in and do that, which yeah. that's an, that's a weird one, right? Because the thumbnails and the titles, it's like it violates everything. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I don't yeah. know. If that's really a good example. Well, he came in with an audience. People forget about Sam. Sam came in with his uh, with a million plus audience on TikTok. Okay. And at that time, when like you, if you can remember, I, my consultant, we were talking about like we were, he's, we we're talking about like in, uh, TikTok, and he's like, hey, by the way, I was at an event. TikTok is now pushing longer content. And Sam's already got a channel on TikTok that's doing really well with a very loyal audience. And then now they're pushing longer content. And just like Noel Dizel back in the day, when shorts started, he just took his TikTok, went to shorts yeah. and blew up. Same thing with Sam. Sam didn't come out of nowhere. Yeah. He already had this great audience that was already loyal that wanted to see more. So when he came to, you know, to this space, it's like he just like dominate the algorithm the algorithm probably didn't know what to do with themselves well like that this. makes sense because the, yeah. the influx is out of hand it was, it was like the the amount of like you gotta think like as soon as we're tension, if you look on you know you know the analytics as soon as we're tension, like your ctr is good and your and your um view uh, view duration is up that video is getting recommendations left and right and he's getting he's getting recommendations for like an hour video Mm -hmm. Like an hour, like that you're getting like, you know, this video got 200 something plus thousand views on an hour video. And I'm just like, this guy's killing it. Like this is going to blow. And that's why I just, and now his audience is like, and you listen to the guy, like he's smart. I don't know if he's doing some purpose, but the training is this much of his video. The rest is like book as like, you know, you know, bookshelf by like, you know, bookend by him talking in a car. Yeah. And he's got this like voice. It's like, yeah, you know. <laughs> So like half the people aren't even watching it. They're just putting it on the background. So that direct, that view time mm -hmm. is like constantly up. Like if he's, if he's conscious about that, he's the absolute genius. If he's not, doesn't matter. It's still, it's still smart. But that's, that's why like he's, so people are like, yeah, I mean, people like him because he's just, he just himself. He doesn't do any of the clickbait stuff. He's like, no, 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 no. He already came with a good audience that already liked him. He didn't have to do any of those things. Yeah. So that's pulling a lot of the triggers right from the jump. For, right from the jump. He, yeah. he got to bypass that with having an audience. If you, if someone's like, Hey man, start a YouTube channel right now. I'm going to give you either, I'm going to give you a hundred thousand dollars or I'll give you a hundred thousand subscribers that are engaged right away. We're going to take, I'm like, give me a hundred thousand subscribers now. If you got a hundred thousand subscribers, you're probably going to make a hundred thousand dollars around that. Mm -hmm. Like it's going to, 
you know, and it, and it, and it kind of like, it does kind of play that. If you want to know what someone makes, they're probably making something around the, their subscriber base. How have you stayed relevant over like, what a decade now? Yeah. Cause yeah. It, that changes, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. because you go from, you know, training for the bodybuilding and then through the pro card. So it's a journey, right? Yeah. So people can see. And I think that's the attraction. They can follow yeah. you through this journey throughout that whole period of time. Yeah. But it's kind of the same. If you don't watch yourself, it can be the same you journey. Can, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. here's the prep. Here's the yeah. off season. Here's the prep. Here's the off season. Yeah. So at some point you have to change yeah. and still keep that in there. So yeah. when did you make that realization? Um, during the uh, pandemic. Um, the, the, I like, I knew, like, I'm like, again, when I get fully into something, like I'm the guy that, you know, that I know everything about my YouTube channel. I know everything about analytics. I know everything about anything you could think of when it comes to it. I'm fully into it. I made, my mistake was I made content that I wanted to make. And there's nothing wrong with that, but only like, you know, that makes only a few people going to watch what you want to watch. So when it came to the pandemic and I, I only had 800 uh, subscribers at the beginning and uh, it was right before, I remember it was right before the Arnold was canceled. And I'm like, oh man, that's crazy. And all of a sudden, our, we, me and Greg had a bodybuilding show. We had to cancel our show. So I was like, you know what, man, I'm going to try and, and Greg, I was editing for Greg at the time, like before that. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to try and get my channel to a thousand. Let me just do that. And pandemic happened and I started making, you know, my first, I had a, uh, I made a uh, homegrown gains plan. And it was basically like, whatever you have at home, um, whatever your goals are, I'll make a plan that will help you get to your goals realistically. So if you're trying to put on like 10 pounds of muscle, you only got a band. I mean, I'm going to be honest, I'm going to get 10 pounds of muscle, but we can still keep our muscle on that we've made and, you know, whatever, whatever. So I started doing videos on how to, you know, that's basically what it is. And it was like how to do something for beginners. Now, at that time, I thought that my beginners um, were my beginner content was beginner content. It wasn't beginner content at all. Like I dummy down my stuff to like, you know, talk to your daughter type thing and not hit against anybody, but it's like, we gotta understand, like no one is going to school for this stuff. Like, like I could ask somebody like, well, what's in, what's the, what's this bone called? I have no clue. You've been in your body for your entire life and you have no clue what that bone is. They're not supposed to know what that bone is. Mm -hmm. But you're also using that part of your body to do whatever it was. So I started to, I went down from dumbing my content down to like as something as small as like grab the dumbbell in the middle. That's going to help you with balance instead of having it like stuck to your bottom hand, your arms doing this. And what time did you do that? Like how many subscribers did you have I had when you did that? A thousand. Okay. And then after, and then the first, the lo first lockdown, I came out with 10,000. So the first lockdown was like, for us, it was like, our government was doing some wacky stuff. We had like, I think it was like March till May. Um, Cause right now I was like, I did, uh, I did, uh, that's when I started getting leaner than Greg Doucette. I was prepping for the California pro. I was doing open. My goal, my goal at that time was I'm going to make it to Olympia. I know I have to put on five to seven more pounds of lean tissue. I was on stage at 2.30. I need to put that extra on. So that was my prep. And then I used, uh, I was like, well, I might as well continue my prep and then not do X, Y, and Z. I came to the anabolics. So during that, that, that was my journey that people would watch. Then I would dive into what I'm doing for that entire journey. And I saw like, oh, like, and Greg was doing this stuff too. So if at the time I was like, he was in my ear as well too. We were, uh, we were bouncing things off each other. So I, I knew that, you know, what people wanted to see. Right now, they need to know what they're doing. They're stuck at home with money in their pockets. So let's like teach you what to do. So that was at the beginning of the prep and I learned that. Then when I got out, not bringing the prep, sorry. At the end of my prep, we actually, me and Greg actually did like a, a fake show. We actually like competed against each other and stuff. It was pretty funny. Um, when that pandemic, when that, that shutdown was done, I had 10,000 subscribers. And I was like, holy shit. And I got like my first like, you know, paycheck from it. And it was like, I think it was like 300 bucks. I was like, holy shit, 300 bucks from YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then I did the same thing at what no, most people do when they have a job that went back to back to the gym. It was a comfortable paycheck. It was the most money I've ever made anyway. Um, at that time, um, it was like 50,000 to coach and I was a head coach. I was managing went another lockdown. So what the heck? So again, I was like, 
let's just do more stuff. Let's get into it more. So I was like back and forth. Then it was last, my last straw was like when I, um, I had to leave my, the, the company, the, the gym. Um, and then I was just like, yo, let's just, let's just dive into this thing. I'm not working for anybody else anymore. Let's just do this. And I put all of my effort into teaching how to do certain things. So now when it comes to staying relevant, it's listening. It's like listening to the audience. Like I'm like, I know what the audience, the audience is going to tell you exactly what they want, but then you have to know his seasons as well too. So like, you have to know like what your audience wants. And then you have to like do enough so that you don't get pigeonholed into certain content. So I don't want to get pigeonholed into only doing prep stuff. I want to get pigeonholed into doing any kind of only drama stuff. And I also don't want to get pigeonholed into only doing training stuff. So I made sure that I, we have this thing called my four pillars. The four pillars are training, nutrition, um, cardio and mental health. And obviously training tutorial videos get a lot of, a lot of views. Um, the other ones get good views. Funny thing is like, is the mental health stuff gets really good too as well, which is crazy. Um, I shouldn't say it's crazy. It's just, you really see that there's a need for it. Like people want, like people have a lot more to deal with that than you, than you think. So I always make sure that we have those, a good mix of those things in the, in the content. So I don't get stuck on one thing and then knowing when to, you know, change things up in, ter in terms of like, you know, um, I do voiceovers again now and I tested that one out. It gets good views. Um, you know, ask again, Hey, you want me to do more videos like this? Let me know. And it's an easier edit and people like it, but they still also like the funny or comedy comedic stuff of, what to do and what not to do, what's necessary, those things. So it's always like, always asking your audience, like, you know, what do you want to hear? What do you want to, like, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, you know, just do anything. But when it comes down to it, the consumers know best. So when you're listening to the audience, there's a, there's, it's a double-edged sword yeah. because in that audience, there's also all the criticism that yeah. comes with that. Yeah. How do you navigate that? You look at um, easy, some easy metrics. Uh, you look at like how many, how many likes does that comment get? Right. So someone's like, oh man, thanks a lot for not doing any more of those drama stuff. I'm glad you like this comment I get. It's like, this is what you're looking for, this kind of content. Hope you don't go back to the drama content. And then you see that and then there'll be like 50 likes. It's like, I'm gonna listen to that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was like, oh man, like like another video on on back. Uh and then it's like it was like three comments or three likes, and then a slew of comments being like, you can go to another channel if you want to. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, you, you look at the, you look at the, I'm, I'm really good at reading metrics and, you know, variables that can, uh, that can give you a good insight of what to do and what not to do. But like, if like, you know, the good and bad, like, you know, you want to listen to the, the quote unquote haters. Cause if the haters say something and you got to understand too, like if they're just haters from another channel coming just to the braid your shit, yeah. that's also like, you know, those idiots, mm -hmm. but the ones that actually like, you know, they want, they are super criticism, the criticizers, whatever. Um, if they have a lot of, comments and you know that are on the same you know same mindset or you kind of listen to it right well it's what you just said is what a lot of people don't know how to do yeah right you're looking at the comments as analytics yeah right so i guess a bunch of bad ones that are coming from somebody else it's just more engagement yeah. but um and you would probably see it that way yeah where some people they may have you know 50 comments and then one comment oh, yeah which is bad and then it ruins their whole day yeah, yeah. and it's it's a it's nobody. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, that's why I asked, how do you handle that criticism? Yeah. Because some people have a really hard time with that. And if they, I think if what you just said, if they look at that from the analytics side, yeah, like it's one random comment. You have that, to, you have to look at it from there. It's uh, like, for me, it's like, I always said, like, you know, I've already said the worst things to myself. You can't like, I'm, yeah. you can't beat me on all the bad <laughs> things you can say about myself. So like, and like my brother's a battle rapper and I live with him my whole life. So he's one guy I can get under my skin till now like this, like <laughs> it's mm -hmm. super easy. So I got a lot of practice with like trolls and I'm like one of the best ones at it. So like, either way, when I look at these things, like I, I, I try to, I, I try to say this in a way where it's not, you know, like harsh until I meet a subscriber. They're not as they're, they're not like they're real to me, but they're not, they don't have a face, you know, like, I don't know if this is a, a person that is just a, you know, someone just a bot or someone just being like, you know, I, I hate your guts or something, whatever, right? I read all comments and I take them, I, I appreciate all the, because I look at it as like, hey, you took your time to watch my shit 
and to comment and take a time in your day, I completely, totally respect it. But I can't get emotionally charged from anything that they say because I don't, I, I, there's, there's not a face to it, right? Mm -hmm. I do care because I, because I, I meet them when I go to, you know, the Arnold or the Olympia or whatever. And then I meet these people face to face and I meet a bunch of them. Then I get, and I, I, and I have like, you know, I have a Discord and I have like, you know, members, members only area. So I see a lot of the ones that are really engaged. And those are people that are like very real to me because I've met them. But when it comes down to it, like it's analytics for me. And then like at the same time too, it's like, I can't get, I, I, I can't emotionally get involved in some of the comments because again, it's going to take me out of my present time, right? Like if I'm looking at this, like, oh, I don't like your channel. Then all of a sudden it's like, oh man, my channel's going to shut down now. What if I get a bunch of people they're going to lose? What if they start, you know, unsubscribing for me? I'm going to lose my channel. You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. You can spiral in those ways. So you have to really look at it in a way where you can, you have to be able to analyze it from a business standpoint and still be very empathetic and know that there are people behind those keyboards, but know that they don't really have a face yet until you actually meet them. Mm -hmm. And that kind of keeps me, my, keeps me at bay. Like I've had some things happen on my channel that I've been like, you know, you get the once in a while, you get the, you know, the slew of, certain people's channels that come over and just want to be like, ah, I did. And you got to be like, ah, all right, let's just deal with this. It's just, you know, it's going to come and it's going to go. And, you know, everyone has their reasons for doing certain things, but you, you just, you can't get emotionally, you know, engaged with it. What are some things with um, content creation that you wish you would have known five years ago? Uh, making content for people that need like, you know, making the right content. Like I, like I was like, if I, if I would have known that they just, they want to know why I was doing what I was doing. Like I, I, I necessarily didn't even have to change my content, to be honest. All I had to do was tell, give them more reason of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And that's the, that was the biggest change. Um, when it came down to it, it was like, I'm making content for myself. Cause I, I like, I like, and, and I found myself doing a lot of what Flex or, or, or Jay Cutler or, you know, um, even I, was, I remember going down the, the rabbit hole. I was just going back in time for fun. I was, I was watching some of um, Rich Piana stuff and he was one of the first guys that really kind of like glorified the, I, what I thought at the time was like great cinematography and he had the lights on and he had, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the silhouette. And I looked back and I'm like, God, I didn't even have a mic. He's mm -hmm. like, this is some basic shit here. And it was, um, so like I found myself like, making content that i was that was very me but very copied as well too and at that time it's like if someone wants to watch a rich piano ask something they're gonna watch rich piano someone wants to watch yeah. flex lewis ask kind of stuff they're gonna watch like who are you you're an amateur bodybuilder from canada and the algorithm is already against you anyway like it, like i'll have to build my my the uh, my following up from zero so i thought that i would just get followers from there just thinking that i can just do what they're doing when they're watching them because of who they are, right? And at the and at the time, like I didn't realize how much they were educating as well, too. And you know, YouTube's a very a, a different beast. Like it's it's engagement heaven. Like you get to engage with the people that you are fans with. So like I wasn't engaging at all when I was doing when I was doing anything. Like when I was I have my hat on. I, I used to have no hair. My hat be like low. I was like, yeah, so like and doing, you know, and I wasn't that bad in front of the camera, but I looking back and I was like, geez, like who's watching this? Like, yeah. I'm not watching 50 minutes of this. Like, this is boring. Well, everybody's going to suck at the start too. Yeah. 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 But you know, it's again, I would just, I would have just made content for the audience. Like, what do you need to like, I would have asked more questions. Like, what do you want to know? Why are you eating this way? Okay. This is why I eat. And I would have probably got more, more views if I would have just did that. Would it be safe to assume? Cause if, if you're writing a blog post or something like that, it's the general consensus is write this as if a third grader can read it. Yeah. Would it be safe to assume that the content that you're going to put on YouTube should be in that same direction? Yeah. I wrote, I wrote the ebook the same way. The, like, the ebook was written like, it was written for, like, I didn't want, I don't want to, I, like, I know that no one's educated in this, like, at all. Like, there's the only type of fitness where we go through, if they're even our age or older, it's like gym class. Right. Like no one's telling you how to eat, how to train, how to like anything, absolutely anything at all. So like you have to explain it to a way that they can understand it. And I think that's one of the, the for me, like I was a I've I've been coaching for so long, but I'm like, I'm 
I'm also like, I was one of those guys who was coaching, like when I was really coming up in the coaching part, like in the, in the coaching business, I was doing like 40 plus hours a week of like one-on-one -on -one coaching. So like when I started really like money was coming in, I had like 20 bucks an hour, which is still pretty good. I was like talking to a lot of people. I was dealing with a lot of personalities. I was in sales before too. So I knew how to adjust my personality for, you know, the 75 year old woman who has a broken, you know, who's doing, who's got knee surgery. That's a golfer. You know, I, the kid that's training for football or basketball or hockey, you know, the person just wants to lose weight, the mom that wants to look good. So there's, there's all of these different types of personalities that I have to teach how to properly squat. And each one of those people are going to have a different way of understanding a cue. So the, a lot of what I've learned um, was from like being in person coaching and knowing like, okay, this is, I can't just talk science to these people. Like they're not going to, you know, like how to engage your lats. Like, all right, when you do a deal, pretend someone's taking your armpits and you're like, oh shit, everyone knows how to, everyone doing this is going to be like, oh, like, yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Like that's there. So I, I came up with these certain uh, cues of by just, you know, bearing on other people and being able to dummy things down. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. I think, I think the problem I think is, is people take their education and think they, they have to like, you know, just talk to them like, you know, words that they not ever going to understand. Well, so sometimes I wonder if a, a lot of people that want to go down that road are trying to one up other people that are out there to make it look like they're smarter than everybody else. Yeah. Where that's the opposite of what they want to do. Yeah. Because then they're only making content for people that are at the same education level or yeah. higher yeah. than what they are yeah. to try to be impressive. Yeah. Where great, you yeah. know, 10 people, you know, will be interested <laughs> yeah. in your stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, meanwhile, everybody else is just going to pass on it because you make them feel stupid. Yeah. And when I train clients and gem pop type of thing, you can't make them feel stupid. No, no. They're not going to come back and yeah. they're not stupid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they can pull you aside and if they're in finance and you're stupid. Yeah, exactly. You're yeah. really stupid, <laughs> yeah. you know, so it's, yeah. they just don't care, yeah. you know, about that. And they don't want to care about it. They just want to do yeah. what they want to get in better shape. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a huge takeaway that people that, cause we have people submit articles sometimes and stuff like that. It's like, Oh shit. Who are you writing this for? <laughs> Your professor? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, cause it, that's not going to work here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not at all. Like yeah. throw it through chat GPT and yeah. ask it to rewrite it for a third <laughs> yeah. grade level. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, kinda, exactly. Kinda, exactly. Kind of go down that route. Yeah. Um, before we started the podcast, you were talking a little bit about some of the frustrations with uh, pro bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what are those reiterate on those a little bit? Uh, for me, it's like, like when I came from football, um, like again, I'm saying like I played football. I've I've been around you know agents. I've my I have friends who, you know, played the NFL, CFL, NHL, MLB. So when I came to this sport, I came to it in the same mindset that this is you know when you are a professional, you know that's how I would expect to be treated as a professional. So when it came down to it, I was, I was like, you know, a lot of the, like the, the money was one of the things I was looking at. I'm like, I'm like, how is Chris Bumstead making 50 G's? You know, like there's a point that I, I, I believe that every bodybuilder, not everybody, every top, every winner at the Olympia should have a hundred thousand dollars minimum, minimum. Right. The next can have like, I don't know, 20,000, I don't know, however you want to deal it. But I think like for the amount of stuff, you know, that we do, and I, and I get it, like, cause like, you know, we'll, we'll say like, you know, we put our bodies in the line. It's like, yes. And then, then, then the argument will be like, well, yeah, it's your choice or whatever. It's like, and we're still doing that. Like we're still doing it and we're still paying to do it as like, I'm a professional and I have to pay just like an amateur to compete. Now I, I get it. Like, you know, there's. There's certain, like, um, I would say, uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? Um, oh my God, my brain freeze. Uh, you know, you're not, not accountable. It's like you're liable. Sorry. Yeah. I get, I get that if you do certain things, you're now liable, actually. I understand if you put out, like, you know, there's a union, you're now liable. And that's like, that can get very tricky. And I get it. But at the same time, it's like my pro card doesn't get me a discount at a, at a, a supplement store 
you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's like it should it sh we sh it should be it should be geared towards more of like you know yeah like you know like, and i and i hate always hearing like no one gets in the bodybuilding for money i know we don't get into the bodybuilding for the money but we still want to fucking make a career I and mean, we still like we still have like there's families out there like and i'm people this year the olympia the arnold's are you know i'm pulling out of the arnold's because you know i want to stay with my family i want to you know and there's and there's these great reasons to not compete this year and they're like they're and none of them not, not many are health reasons but they're like you know i want to take more time with my family have a proper off season yada yada but then it's like you got to go back to your job there's like there's not enough i feel that's there to sustain this lifestyle when the bodybuilder makes like the competitors make the league like the 100 percent they make the league now i like i get the comment like you know like we got you'd be thankful for the the you know for the league i'm like 100 percent i am if it wasn't for bodybuilding if it wasn't for the for the this platform or this i wouldn't be able to do what i'm doing but make it accessible for us to like you know even if there's like even like when it comes like i snowboard right um i used to roll big i was a fruit booter back in the day in the, even in that in that uh realm there's sponsorships not everybody makes an amount of money like say well like you know fighting not everybody's gonna make you know uh usman money or whatever not gonna make all that money the only few do but at least some of them make a good paycheck and there's a lot of that that's there it's like how are you surviving off this you know what I mean? Like you have to have another job to do this. Okay, cool. I get it. But at least at the bigger shows, can we give more money to those athletes? You know what I mean? And then there'll be an argument like, because usually someone who's retiring who didn't make that much money at all is talking about like, I don't like the reason why I'm not competing anymore, whatever, because I don't really need to like, I, I, I get paid less. Like, competing is getting paid less. It's actually time out of my day. Like I'm losing money, like doing the prep and, and, and training during that prep and doing all my work in that prep, it was like, I need this to be done soon because there's a lot more things that I cannot do that I have to put my time and energy for bodybuilding. And I loved every bit of it. I love the sport. I love the comp commodity. I love the yeah, IFBB is great. But if I'm going to put all this into that, there should be a, a level that at least at the highest show that it can have some very life-changing money, right? $50,000 is life-changing. $100,000 is life-changing, right? Especially for the first, first person who just yeah. makes it there. You know, you, you win a show, especially as like a, a bikini competitor or a figure competitor. You're not winning more than $5,000, right? You're not at all, right? You, like, unless you're a bodybuilder, a, an open-class bodybuilder, you're making $10,000 for a show between maybe ten twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for the winner, right? Maybe. 10 max. So, okay, so you do like three shows, you do three thirty thousand dollars you get tax on that, or you walk with maybe twenty-five thousand. Okay, cool. You have a job still? Are you taking time off of your job to do that? Okay, cool. All right. So then when you do your first show and you win, then here's no here's fifty thousand dollars. Be thankful for it. Yes. But a hundred thousand dollars for the amount of money that this entire industry brings. I, I think there could be a better job where the sponsors and the head of the league get together and pool it and all, you know, sponsors, um, you know, some of the companies, anything that involved, anything where you go to a show and you see banners everywhere. Yeah. Right. You're making, there's no, there is no something companies. If there is no fitness industry and at the top of the fitness industry are bodybuilders. The only reason why there is bodybuilding around is because of the weeders and Arnold making it something that is attractive for people to do it. It's still not mainstream. So the fact that the supplement industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, billions, right? Billions of dollars from just the supplement industry, not including the amount of money that's collected from pro cards, um, your, your athlete card as an amateur, and your sanction fees as, uh, um, promoters entries as well right and entries as well yeah right you can't tell me that there's not something that's there that we can you know because you're getting sponsored anyway like some of the companies are sponsoring shows so you're already giving up money so why don't you why don't you guys all collaborate to sponsor more money or pool in more money so that at these bigger events there's more of a takeaway and guess what 
there's gonna be more people wanting to do those shows even more. Well, from the business side, I wonder, you know, is this sustainable because the supplement companies and all those that are coming in there, they can now just give it to the influencer that has more views, the influencer that has more traction that doesn't even compete at all. Yeah. So that is their competition now. Yeah. You know, yeah. if it's the pro league or IFBB or whatever it is. Yeah. Before they may have had a competitor in yeah. a different federation or whatever it is, but it wasn't really a strong yeah. competitor. Yeah. Now they have a very strong competitor and a lot of the athletes yeah. that really don't even have to compete at all. Yeah. Actually, to, to your point, as you just said, they're, they're not going to because they're going to make less. Yeah. So if they don't figure out how to compete with that, more and more are just going to go that well, route. I mean, it's, I, I think Sam Selleck is a great example. Yes. Right? Sam Selleck does not have to compete in bodybuilding whatsoever. Like, at all. Though he'd be, he, he, would get a, he would get a pay cut between Hostile and his YouTube channel. And I'm pretty sure if he did when he decides to put out some products and whatever else like that, it's over. Mm -hmm. Like he's right. But I can promise you that the IVB would love, or in, even the IVB elite would love to have Sam Selleck as, as one of their bodybuilders. So what do you do now if there's 50 of him? Exactly. Right. right? Because now they're, you know, kids coming in, if, if they're looking to people to aspire to be, is it him yeah. or is it the winner of the Olympia? It's, 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 for me, it's going to be, I want to, I want to be Sam Selleck. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go on. I don't have to, like, I can just do like, I can just do like, you know, summer bulks and summer cuts and winter cuts and winter bulks and whatever. And now people will follow it just like they're following a, a prep for a show. Only thing you have to do is get on stage. You see what I'm saying? But th yeah. th that's their new competitor. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if they're aware. Yeah. You know, of that. And I think that's, and that's why it, I think that that's why you need to pull and be like, Hey, make this more attractive. Like somehow make it more attractive that it, or have it more elite. Like, you know, Sam Selleck is in, you know, Sam Selleck is, is awesome, but you need to make him, you need to make it like on par. Like, Hey man, you're, you could be Sam Selleck, but you also want to be the Mr. Olympia. Yeah. yeah. Cause the Mr. Olympia is going to be like, you know, the Mr. Olympia classic, you know, men's physique, fitness, bikini wellness is going to be all over the place they're going to be lineups of whatever you know what i mean like and they may think that and a lot of other people may think that but going back to what you were saying about your content who's your audience yeah right the audience is the people that are coming up yeah that are aspiring to be yeah. so you won't see that for another decade yeah yeah right so you can make the assumptions like well that is the way it is now yeah like i could say that because i'm fucking old yeah. right yeah. And, it's, and it is yeah. you know and that's i think where that thought process will come in yeah. until you look at what are the 14 year olds what are the you know 15 year olds yeah. the people that are just now getting into this yeah what are they aspiring for yeah right yeah. and it's it's i don't know it's i think it's almost like they could wait um, i remember when um you know You've heard of this, uh, uh, D destroying the, he's, um, he's got a football channel. He was a kicker. Um, he was a oh, McAfee. Was his name Matt? That's the name. McAfee? No, he's a black, black dude. He's from, um, I think he's from the Dominican. He had a channel. He got a scholarship as a kicker. The, um, co then the reason why they took away that whole, like, uh, you know, if you can't make any money out, you can't get a scholarship. Yeah, as, yeah. They took it away because of this kid, right? This kid went in there. He already had too many fo following. They made him choose. He's like, Hey. I'm not going to, I'm going to leave this. I'm going to keep my dream as a, whatever, as an influencer with football, his channel is like, absolutely. He's, he owns part of a, of a, of a arena league right now or a team, whatever. Uh, yeah. I remember what you're talking about. Yeah. Now. Yeah. So like the, and then, you know, what happened with the NCAA, they were like, Hey, you know what? This kid just went on his own way and now he's, you know, it's attractive. And now this kid's getting money. Like we can probably benefit from that. So they took the whole thing away. So they allowed, they allowed the athletes to get sponsorships. So you have all these, you know, it's NCAA athletes who have money from the school and, you know, sponsorship or deals from Nike or Adidas or whatever. And now everybody's making a ton of money together. And it's like this, I think it's like, it's a similar kind of thing. It's like, you either, you either say, Hey, you can't do this and you make someone leave and you have a divide. And then you end up being the league that has, cause you know what I'm saying? Like the consumers control everything absolutely everything and they're getting 
and they're getting older. Those 14 year olds, those, mm-hmm. those are getting older. And some of them are going to be like, Hey, what do I want to do? Do I want to, do I want to be Sam Selleck or do I want to be Chris Bumstead? And there's a lot right now that want to be Sam Selleck and not Chris Bumstead. And it's nuts because Chris has done all that he's done to be who he is. And Sam just popped up and said, Hey man, summer ball, summer cut. <laughs> right day 14 right yeah you're like what the heck yeah man? yeah yeah were there any topics you wanted to go over i didn't bring up i don't know i don't know i don't know i'm a dad <laughs> yeah go into that yeah i'm a, uh, I'm a dad uh in discussion <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um how's your perspective on that change since well, that was the biggest uh ch- that was that was the biggest uh, influence for me is not competing anymore and coming off of uh, off the steroids. How old's your daughter? She's five. She's six this year. Mm-hmm. She's six this year. Mm-hmm. And um, it makes you very, like, like, so when I talk about, like, you know, if I, if I didn't have my mental health together, all the things that are challenging, you know, if I, if I wasn't aware of my program for my parents, like I'm so much, I'm, I'm so aware of everything that I do with my daughter in terms of like how I am treating her. How much do you think the steroids mess with your brain? Lots. I would like, and if it wasn't for me going into mental health, like if it wasn't for me it being in that environment, like I would have had a, I would have been able to be, to have those coping mechanisms and proper, like, you know, um, you know, skills to be able to go through certain things. So like, that made a massive difference. That was like, that was one of the things I was like wondering this prep, like, why am I not feeling as, you know, weird? I'm like, well, oh, cause there's no Novadex. There's no, um, Rimidex. There's no letrozole. There's no Proviron. There's no all the things that are affecting my testosterone, my estrogen, my fat. Like I'm getting rid of my fat with Clen, with T3, with T4, with, um, you know, GW. And then it's like, all right, cool, fat done with that, estrogen now, let's go with the, all, these, you know, all the things that I was doing. And then asking my body to run properly while sustaining all the muscle, while having, you know, have to deal with my mental health was a fucking challenge, absolutely challenge. I remember crying all the time during prep. Like I get to a point where I'm just like, you know, a mix of like being extremely grateful and then down, up and down, but you know, being able to manage it in my head and not fall off the wagon, but I didn't have to deal with it at all. Like this prep was the biggest thing. I was like, this is, I almost felt like I wasn't working as hard because of that one component that wasn't there. And I was like, ah, I'm not doing anything. All those things, all those things do have a massive effect on your mental health. And for the last two years, I went through, when I, when I, when I cut, I stopped cold turkey. And when I was two years, when I killed three, I stopped cold turkey, and in the last two years, I've had a lot of things happen in my life. I'm talking like deaths, murders, sicknesses, highs and lows of business, friendships, leaving, you know, finding out I had a a sister that was 52, you know what I mean? Like, all the things that that, that were like, hey, if your mental health isn't under control, you're definitely, here is all the reasons why you're going to spiral didn't spiral. So while you're raising her, you know, you, you don't want to program her, <clears throat> but at the same time you want to instill values, yeah. which is kind of programming. Yeah. So how are you walking that line? It, it being like watching what I say, watching how, like when I respond to her, like I was like, not being like understanding my programming and then, Cause it's, it's a, it's a really weird thing. Cause that was one of the things I was talking to the therapist about when I, when I first had her, he was like, some of the challenges you're going to have is going through your life again, through your parents' eyes. So, you know, there was one time when, um, my mom one day called me and, and now when I was, you know, when I was younger, I was in Whistler and she was crying and she was like, I, she's like, I saw a commercial and it was this kid, that little kid, and he dropped over a orange juice. Um, container and it was really cute. I remember my father, you, you know, me and your father punished you for doing stuff like that. And she was sad. And I was like, and it was really, you know, it was, it was a good moment. It was before I was in, really in, th- in therapy. And then I'm watching, you know, Selena grow up. And I remember, like, you know, at her age, even like from three now, I remember a lot of my age, 
like very, very early. It's one of those things. One of my strength of weaknesses is like, I have like extreme, like a memory in my dad has it too. I can remember the earliest of my life, which is like a good and a bad thing. But um, going through it, just seeing like, you know, she'll do something and then I'll be like, I remember what my parents did this time. I remember what, what would have happened if I would have did this. I would know what they would have done. And then knowing how not to, like doing the opposite, you know, um, just being more, I'm like, I'm open and loving more than ever. Like I kissed my daughter more times than I've ever kissed in my entire life. Like probably in the last like month, you know, like it's, uh, you know, like when I'm, if I'm, if she does something that is like annoying, I like if she like any like anything that she does, I know is my fault. Right. It's like it's one thing I know for sure. Like if she's doing something or saying something or or she misbehave, she's doing it because she's watching us. Like she's like kids, all they do is like when they're like I remember just being conscious of it when I was when she was first born. She's like a security camera, just just doing this. And I'm like, you're watching us. Like you're just you're taking in everything. So knowing that I was very conscious of like what I'm doing, how I respond. So when you know, when she does something, I know that you're misbehaving because you want my attention and I deserve to get the attention. Because when she's doing something, she did something the other day. The day. <laughs> she just drew on her face. Just, I'm like, hey, Santa, put it down. Don't, you know, don't play it anymore. And I was back on my computer. And then I look back and she's just doing, looking at me like this. Just rubbing. I'm like, Selene, I told you. I'm like, yeah. Baby, don't do that. Dad said not to do that. Blah, blah, blah. blah. Then, you know cleaned it off and got off my computer and hung out with her. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like knowing all those, like knowing I have direct like effect on her life. Like I saw his code. It's like, you know, I gotta, I gotta, you know, I have to watch what I do because I got a child. So I got a kid's childhood in my life in my hands. Like I can ruin this kid by in the first three years of her life. If I wanted to, that's very like, it's like you can easily do that. So you, like, I know that I have to be very conscious of what I do, but I also like do a lot with like, I'm very conscious of like how much I really, really love my kid. Like I am head over heels, like, like every parent is like head over heels to my daughter. And I know that, you know, I don't know, man, it's, it's, uh, yeah, she's dead. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. in a way it's still programming, right? It's very, it's, it's it, you can't, like, you can't, like, it, it's the thing is you can't not program them. Yeah. You know, well, if you don't, somebody else will. Yeah. So you have to, like, and, and I'm very conscious of like what I'm pro, like what, like, yeah. Like, especially like when it comes to like, you know, religion, like, re- like I, like I'm not, I haven't brought up, like I've brought up God when she's brought up God for some, you know, she, she's already watched like deaths happen in the family already. Like at a very young age, it's almost like reliving my life, like through her almost. Cause at a young age, I was exposed to like death at a very young age. A lot of our family dies at home. Was that good for me to see someone take the last breath? I don't know. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, just, so she's, so I, know, I, I see what she, what she can go through, but I have to make sure that the programming I'm doing has good values underneath it, like in the core of it. And like there, you know, when she leaves for school, I say like, Hey, remember she'll be like, she'll be like, be a leader, be kind and stick up for yourself and be brave. I'm like, good. Right. I'm like, there's all, oh, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Like, yeah. And she's, and she, you know, and there's instances that happened at school and she dealt with it in a great way. And I was like, yeah, I'm like, sweet. Like you're, you know, that's good programming. But if you're not conscious of the programming, then all of a sudden they pick up your bad habits. Well, the, the mental fuck there would be <laughs> your parents thought that they were doing good programming yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah. 30 years from now, yeah, you could yeah. be sitting there and she could be saying, you yeah. my whole life up, you know <laughs> yeah. because of this programming yeah. yeah yeah you know so it's just doing the best you can do it's, and that's it yeah yeah there's no manual for it like there's i think i think the difference is like and that's why i, was, I think it's a it's a it's a good devil-edged sword for me this whole thing because it makes me understand my parents so much more mm-hmm. like through through her like you know six years ago you know that's four years into my into therapy um i'm i'm getting exact like perfect examples of there's no, there's no manual for this thing. Like I'm going through a first time, everything with this kid, like every new thing she's doing, I'm doing as well too. So it made me understand like, Oh, okay. I get it. Like, I completely forgive you guys. Like, like, no, I got no qualms, no nothing at all. I get it. Like if you didn't, if like, if I if, like, and again, like it comes to like technology as well too. And just like, you know, 
what was available for our parents then like they're not talking about mental health back then it's like mental health is like you're in a you're in a loony bin mm -hmm. like that's basically what it is with like, oh you're gonna get shock therapy like that's you're gonna get a lobotomy like that's my parents grew up with mental health that in that point right so when it comes to you know programming your kids every you know my kid's gonna be better at it than i am because she's gonna be even more conscious my parents weren't that conscious my mom admitted to us today we're we got this we got this argument today about um about spare the, my mom was praying she prays at she prays at four o'clock she's up praying at four o'clock in the morning and you and my brother have always been like you know one to question and we're like i'm like my brother's like why are you praying at four in the morning i was like well we have we we pray for canada um you know everyone prays i'm like so can't you like like does it matter what time it is like you know <laughs> so we're out of time you know it's four in the morning it's like you know it's I'm like, I'm like, well, it's like, well, God said, you know, we should be pray, pray, never, never cease praying. I'm like, yeah, but like time doesn't, doesn't really evolve in God's, and, you know, and that. So we're talking then we're, we got into like, you know, you know, things that she might've messed up before. And I'm like, well, what does spare the word, spoil the child mean? And then we're getting into, she's like, and she was like, I made a lot of mistakes when I was, when I was younger, but I, I made a ton of mistakes. I didn't know. And she, you know, and she understands like, she gets what spare the word, spoil the child actually means. Back then it was like a, a, a way of like, here, punish your kid. Yeah. If you don't spare the rod you're spoiled the kids gonna be spoiled and they'd be running amok and you're gonna go to hell when it's like actually the spare the rod spoil the child means like you know gently use like the shepherd has a hook on his on his staff you gently guide it back to because if you use it too hard you're gonna get that that that, that sheep is gonna run off or whatever right mm -hmm. so she now knows that and she's admitting to that so like there it's a cool thing that you like you can see that they they eventually understand but it's like my mom will always say like you don't like she always say something like she's such a wise she's wise as hell man like she's a they're both like that's why i respect like i had this conversation this is actually off topic i love my parents but i respect them more than i love them like and that's how i was brought up like i love my parents like i love like i love my parents like everybody else loves their parents but we are brought up to respect our parents and i respect my mom and dad more than i love them because i feel like respect is, is has a little more than love because you can you can you can love somebody and, and not respect them. And then that love kind of, mm -hmm. so when it comes to like that, like, you know, how she was, you know, how she's able to be conscious in some things now, like she's programmed hundred percent. Like she is 80 years old. Her father was a reverend, her grandfather, her, her grandfather was a reverend. That shit's programmed in her, um, in the, in all the right reasons. And we're, and at the end of this whole thing, like, you know, it's, she's, you know, she's conscious of that. She made mistakes. So every parent is going to know that they made mistakes at some point. It's just how early are they going to know their, those mistakes that they made. So for me, it's like, I'm able to, like, if I didn't go through any of these things, like therapy wise, I wouldn't know that I was doing a lot of the things that my father was doing. You know, a lot like my love or the, my discipline for me was done was like, it was violence. Like it was being beat, whipped, spanked, whatever you want to call it. So like if I, and I just treat a lot of my instances in my life through violence, I would figure it out, fight you, right? That, that's how we're going to work things out. So being able to go through this and being conscious of it now, having a daughter, it's like, I know that I can't, I, I know that I can get angry and express it in a very destructive way. I know that I can scold her in a way that is very detrimental to her, you know, development. So having all these things that I know earlier in life. Um, my parents didn't get to have until later in their life. So would it be safe to say that all that adversity that you went through is making you a better 100%, father? hundred percent. A hundred. Cause like my kid would have me wrap around her finger. <laughs> like, that's one of the things like, she's like, like she made, like when she was, she did this like face when she first was born, like, you know, she'd be sad and she like, she did that. And it was like, and you were like, oh my God, that's so cute. Like, oh man, if she learns how to do this and she still does and she conscious of it with her mom, She'll be like, mom, she'll do it. She's like, you know, she's, she's, she's mean and reincarnate. Like it's, you know, parents mm -hmm. are always like, wait till you have kids. So like, you know, I, I see it and I'm, and I, and I watch her and I'm like, oh my God, if I didn't have, if I didn't have my parents upbringing, I would be taken for a ride by this little kid. Cause like, she's really cute and she can get herself out of it, but I can discipline in a way that's not the way my parents discipline me. But it's also like not letting her get away with shit either. So it's like, it's really good that, and to be honest, like in hindsight, it's like all of the shit that I went through with my parents, 
I don't regret any of it, like at all. Like it has made me every little bit of every, everything that is like trauma based. Now that I understand it is like, I get it and I needed it because I needed it to be like, it, if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for that, like you look at programming as like, like as it can be a good and bad thing. But a lot of the, if you, if you, if you take like a sifter, like, and you sift out, you know, you're doing this and, and you're sifting for gold and a lot of the shit that falls out before you get to the nuggets, a lot of that program, that bad programming is gone. The good stuff from that programming that I have is what helped me get here right now. Because it wasn't for my mom being like very like, you know, God has a plan for you. Like stop do it, you know, and punish me. The punishments weren't, you know, necessary for most of the time, to be honest. But it wasn't for that. I wouldn't have that in me to be to always want to run to get help from something or somewhere. I wouldn't always have this like pursuit to bettering my life. I wouldn't have this like resilience of like, you know, shit's going on in your life. Like I've been through some, I've been through hell and back. And if it wasn't for that, of you know, it wasn't for those things, I wouldn't have been strong enough to be able to do it. Hundred percent. Well, it's it's there's those things, but then there's learning from those things. Yeah. Because yeah. you could have went through those things, but never learned from any of those. Yeah. And then just been yeah. worse. Yeah. You know, and so that's the adversity can help. Yeah. Right. Yeah. As long as you learn from it. 100%. Right. Yeah. So that's the caveat in there because you take yeah. that therapy all the way. Yeah. You can still have all those same stories. Yeah. And not. But then the way that you're going to raise your daughter is going to be completely different. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and potentially even be in the same place. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because we know shitheads. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. You know yeah. that are there as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But if they don't learn from either way, the adversity can propel you forward. 100%. But some learn, some don't. Yeah. You know, and it can be debated what lessons they learn. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Sometimes you learn that oh, I'm a hard motherfucker. I can just go through anything. Yeah. Yeah. And you just drill down into the next thing. Yeah. With the same aggressive, same, yeah. you know, way of doing things. Yeah. Which just continues the cycle yeah and i'm still going through like i'm still yeah. like even you know my age there's still things that i'm like conscious i'm like i'm still doing some of these things still that i need to you know work on more like you're like you're always evolving but there's awareness yeah yeah exactly that's the difference yeah yeah you yeah. know is to, to catch yourself and be like oh shit yeah yeah yeah. you know yeah i don't know if i want to apologize it for it but <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I shouldn't have done that yeah exactly you know? so it's that processing yeah. part yeah um any other topics that you wanted to cover oh oh, oh i think we touched a lot of i'm getting like i mean <laughs> i don't know, I don't know this is just, uh, there's so much more we could talk about than me and I'm getting canceled. Yeah. So yeah, I went, well, I wanted to hit the, um, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to hit the mental health and nutrition, yeah, yeah. the, the training yeah. and then the social media aspects. Yeah. I mean, I think, I don't know. I think you hit him. I think you hit them all, man. Any final thoughts? Final thoughts for me, a final thoughts is always gonna be like drinking, drinking everything in, in the present. Like it's, uh, at, at one point I'm, I'm watching just, just knowing about you through YouTube, all of you done, John Meadows, like this, in, like this realm, like being here in the present has been like one of the coolest things. Like this is, and it's, and I was talking to uh, Owen earlier, being in the presence of being in, in your mind, like being in your, in your, at one point was like a thought. Like, I want this and to be in this, like, empire. Well, I look at it as an empire. It just, it gives me inspiration as to, like, you know, keep, like, I look at, like, you know, I don't look at you as, like, you're, like, I look at you as, like, I feel like we're the same age, to be honest. But then when I look at people that are older than me that are doing this, it makes me excited. Because it makes, also makes me, like, hey, man, you don't have to have everything right now. Like, there are steps to this. And I can almost guarantee that there, the, I don't know what 20 years ago looked like with this. <laughs> not this. right you know what i mean <laughs> so like to be here and to and to like sit into like in all of this is like extremely inspiring and surreal for me thank so you i appreciate i appreciate uh you know being a guest here you know going having this experience being able to talk like this is one of the best uh open conversations i've ever been to have with someone so thank you yeah i appreciate it what's the best way for people to get a hold of you reach you follow you 
Uh, my phone number is. It's okay. <laughs> no, no. I'll stop that real quick. <laughs> yeah. um, so I made it super easy um, uh, for coaching, anything coaching, yeah, ebooks, coaching, one on one coaching, uh, you, uh, plans, johnnyshreve.com. My YouTube channels, Johnny Shreve. My Instagrams, Johnny Shreve. TikTok, Johnny Shreve. Everything, Johnny Shreve. Really easy. We'll have a Super link in easy. the description. I want to thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank and you. we're done. Yes, sir. America Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to AmericaHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative and medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The discount code is table talk. All right, guys, we've got a new limited edition drop, the original Mountain Dog Tea that John Meadows had us design from the very beginning. So it's the first tea that he had made. Once again, this is a limited edition item. So when they're gone, they're gone. While I have your attention, you've seen me wear this one in a few podcasts to date. We've been holding back on it. This here, the four star tea, I think that's what we call it. It's on the website, new items, also under limited edition. Check out our shoulder saver pads. It's an easy way to do limited restricted range of motion exercises like board press that basically you just pop the pad on the bar, reduces the range of motion, pop it back off when you're done. Thank you guys for the support. Head over to EliteFTS.com. All right, guys, if you like the Table Talk podcast, then you're going to love the crew. If you're struggling with trying to get through a sticking point, you're trying to figure some specific aspect of your training out that you just can't dial in, you're dealing with injuries, you're trying to figure out how to better optimize your training, all the stuff you're seeing on social media is confusing, and all you need is a little guidance and support or just somebody to look at your lifts to make sure that they're either heading in the right, right direction or if there's a weak point in the lift, they can point out what that weak point is. Well, that's what we have the crew for. So when you join the crew, you get an extra Table Talk podcast each month called The Crew Cast. You also get access to our Discord community, which has a training Q&A, form checks with top coaches, mindset section, nutrition, training logs, programs, over 30 ebooks, plus exclusive ebooks just for the crew, webinars, lectures, seminars, giveaways from ranging from full strength equipment. We've given away many yoke bars this year. We've given away actually pieces of strength equipment as well as accessory items and you get exclusive crew discounts. So go to the link in the description that says join the crew, click it, join now and start getting stronger today. Elite FTS was founded in 1998 with the aim to live, learn and pass on. We've done this through training related content that allows you to become the strongest athlete and coach that you can. Over the past two decades, actually two and a half decades, we've published more complimentary training media than anybody else in the industry. When you look at the number of articles, the Q&As, the blogs, the videos, the podcasts, there's over a million pages of content that we've put out there. We've been able to do this through your support of Elite FTS. So when you purchase Elite FTS strength equipment, bands, accessories, gear, apparel, or anything through the site, you directly help support the content that we put out, which in turn helps support other people on their journey of becoming stronger and better coaches. So stronger athletes and better coaches, which encompasses the aim and the vision to live, learn, and pass on. So I thank you for the support that you've been giving for the past 
25 years and encourage you to keep supporting Elite FTS into the future so we can all help more people become better and stronger. Discount code TABLETALK for 10% off your first order. Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything that you need and nothing that you don't. In other words, no sugar, no artificial coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, and no BS. With Element, I love the watermelon. The watermelon tastes freaking awesome. I drank one pack every day, no matter what. People that train out here, it's sitting out here for them all the time. The boxes don't last very long. Right now, Element is offering Table Talk listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packages free with any Element order. Get yours at drinkelement.com backslash table talk. The deal is only available through the link in the description. The other thing is if you don't like it, you can just give it away to a salty friend and Element will give you a 100% refund. No risk, money back guarantee. Head over to drinkelement.com backslash table talk. 